Yes.
Okay, colleagues, uh, please take your seat. I think we can uh, we can start. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for being here. There is a lot of interest, uh, people online also. Um, okay, say so. Um, I'll say a few words to start with. Then uh, um, Federico Fubini is going to take over. We have the two panels, and then uh, Giancarlo Corsetti will uh, um, uh, end the this first part of the of the session. Um, so this is the EMU Lab. Um, so EMU uh, Laboratory. We launched this at the end of la, of last year. Uh, mm, so within the Robert Schumann Center, where we are now, uh, the two chairs. Uh, so Giancarlo's uh, Robert uh, um, Pierre Werner uh, chair across economics at Robert Schumann, and the Tommaso Padua Schioppa chair myself. Um, and the idea is. Uh, to give a kick to the um, to the debate on economic and monetary union, trying to bring in different perspectives, a multidisciplinary um, approach, and in particular, um, bringing together uh, um, you know policymakers, scholars, market analysts, and I think we are blessed actually here uh, because of um, we have around the table. Uh, uh, basically, all the international organizations uh, uh, who are, you know, directly relevant for uh, Europe, so Commission, uh, ECB, um, OEC, uh, OECD, IMF. Uh, so, I mean, more than this, difficult to to imagine, and uh, prom very prominent uh, scholars. So now, the aim of the uh, of the lab, I have said, in terms of final product, we will try to condense all what we learn into a report that we pl uh, plan to publish uh, next spring summer in so 2025 um, on the various uh, issues related to European integration, economic uh, and monetary um, and monetary union. So we started uh, the first. Uh, session of the lab uh, at the beginning of January, so on the 9th of January, on uh, history of economic and monetary union. So we wanted to take a broad uh, perspective, looking back in order to look forward. And uh, it was an excellent uh, debate. And this is the second, uh, the second session. We are going to have a third one. Um, so you can uh, um, put it in your agenda and save the date uh, on the 14th of May on uh, Capital Markets Union. Um, so we cover a bit the, we start to cover, you know, several, uh, several grounds. So today's is on fiscal uh, stabilization. Um, Giancarlo and myself um, published uh, in January a paper on the 25 years of uh, uh, economic and monetary union. Uh, what we say there is that um, EMU and the euro sailed uh, on, uh, you know, imperfect, incomplete architecture. So on, uh, you know, ECB monetary policy, clearly uh, unique. Fiscal on the, um, based very much on rules, the stability and growth pact after the, uh, the Maastricht uh, uh, treaty rules, and then third, the, the no bailout, no, no uh, transfers union type of, uh, um, uh, of provision. Now, there was awareness, that's what we say in the paper, that uh, uh, that kind of uh, model, you know, had, you know, it was unlikely to fly smoothly, let's put it like that. You know? um, there was uh, uh, two views uh, underlying the possible next steps of economic uh, and monetary union was uh, one was and we say it in the uh, in the paper more the german view uh, german inverted commas so we'll have to do whatever is needed at the national level in order to make sure that you create the room for maneuver to respond to shocks when shocks would come uh, and on the on the um, fiscal side, that implied that you would, uh, you know, applying strictly the rules of um, the Stability and Growth Pact, you go towards close to balance, then you have uh, what we thought was ample room, 
between uh, the uh, medium term objective and the um and the 3% and that would also allow to bring that on a downwards uh, trajectory and i remember actually uh, you know everybody has a past i remember here myself working with uh, mike artis uh, here many of you actually uh, remember that where we, I mean, we wrote a paper on, uh, you know, minimum benchmarks in order not to under, you know, fluctuations of the, um, of growth and, and uh, measures of the output gap, you would not go above the 3%. So this was the, together, obviously, to the um, structural reforms uh, that were ne needed in order to, in case, of, in case of shocks, reallocate resources, you know, smoothly. Uh, Beside that, there was the French view. The French view was, uh, okay, when the time comes, when the political conditions are ready, we'll set up a euro area budget of central fiscal stabilization that will do the job uh, at, the at the central level. So basically, we talk about the German view and the, let's say, more bottom-up approach in the first panel and the um, and more the top-down uh, there's a French uh, view in the second panel more on the on the central fiscal stabilization. I think both uh, um, views run into trouble somehow. Uh, we were ask, actually asked the last time uh, um, in, during the first uh, session whether, because we made a bit, we said something similar, whether at the end of the day it was Germany who won. Uh, or French, and I think the jury is still out, uh, and that's why we have the discussion, uh, the discussion today. Um, certainly, uh, what we can say is that the idea of creating room for maneuver in good times, for then having, um, you know, room for maneuver in the opposite direction in bad times, I think that did not work all that well. There was a prosecutorial bias uh, inherent to in national policies. I think the idea that to have uh, two to three percent room for maneuver, uh, you know, proved a little bit, um, you know, not supported by evidence, and especially in in the case of large shocks, and the idea also that you have uh, automatic stabilizers, which are seen in a positive way. So that was uh, at the beginning of EMU, you know, negative coordination. You automatic stabilize; they have many good properties. But in fact, and we are, we are going to discuss this, unlikely to be optimal. You know, they uh, automatically stabilize, stabilize as national level. You know, they are they are the result of choices made for other purposes, for for insurance, for redistrib for redistribution, not for stabilization. So the likelihood that they have they uh, that they are fine um, in terms in adequate, I think, is contentious. Um, I have to say, I'm not fully convinced either of what we always say, that automatic stabilizers are timely. They're not really timely. I mean, you have to lose your job before uh, you get uh, the unemployment insurance, and you have to have your income falling before you can profit from uh, um, you know, transfers or reduction in the, tax, uh, in the tax rate. So this is also to be, to be discussed. I mean, on the establishment of the euro area budget, I think the risks highlighted to you know moral hazard uh, uh, risk of a transfer union. I think still uh, um, still there. Um, we made a proposal. We I mean me, we <laughs> I talk about myself with the previous hat actually back uh, 2018 a proposal for a uh, European investment stabilization function uh, French inspired at the time and then eventually it would you know. Chipped on uh, in various uh, um, areas and things, and eventually were buried by the um, by the COVID and the and the response that we have uh, we had there. So, so this is you know just to um, set a bit this uh, the scene. First panel uh, on uh, um, uh, national stabilizer, second panel on the more central stabilization. Um, I think there is something run, uh, running across the two panels uh, that I think we may want to uh, discuss. And it is, uh, okay, one is the future or next generation EU. So somehow post end of 2026, something will happen on that front. Future of the EU budget, this is 2027. So if you think about something at the 
to be put in place or strengthened at the central level, that is the rendezvous. Um, I think there is the issue of the interplay between fiscal stabilization and the new fiscal rules, which have been uh, basically, uh, if not formally adopted, very, mu very um, much so in substance. And finally, there is the interplay with the single monetary policy. So that is a policy mix and uh, you know good articulation between the monetary and the fiscal uh, leg. Um, okay, you have seen uh, the panel uh, participants. We are extremely uh, lucky. Uh, uh, we are lucky also having I uh, have announced we have we have Ben Olstrom at least who stays with us for the first uh, panel. So very very welcome. Uh, um, uh, also, so we are honored to have you uh, here, at least for part of the works. So with this, hand over to uh, Federico, who is going to manage the traffic um, and moderate the, pa the panels. So uh, my name is Federico Fubini. I'm an um, editor at large with uh, Corriere della Sera. Uh, I'm based in Rome, but actually I was born in Florence and grew up a few hundred meters from here. So. When Marco invited me, I thought it was all a plot to let me understand that uh, I got all wrong in my life living uh, more than 30 years ago. Um, but in fact, uh, um, it's a quite timely discussion because in the end we have uh, a new fiscal framework. We could have said that, uh, okay, now it's settled. There is no more to do for the moment, but uh, apparently it's not true. Uh, in my experience, uh, I'm not at an economist, I'm very much a journalist steeped in my trade, but in my experience, what I see when I see economic policymakers, I see people who uh, sort of carry scars from the shocks of the last 15 years. So there is a need for, for answers and, and we have a stellar panel to start with. Uh, and uh, so it's really 20 minutes uh, each and uh, Professor Blanchard, you start. Good, I have slides. Good. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I am very excited at the idea that we can discuss this topic, which is fairly high on my mind at this point, uh, I would change the title to why we should have an increased focus on the thematic stabilizers. And if I convince you that that's worth exploring, then I will have earned my keep in my reimbursement. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let me make a number of general uh, comments. I, I should say this is very much work in progress. I had a the first go at it at an ECB conference uh, two months ago. Uh, I have a serious deadline in June, and this is in between. And you'll see there are more questions than answers, but maybe the questions are interesting. So the point is, when you think about stabilization, fiscal policy, if used right, and I use bold for reasons which are obvious, or equivalently, if we just write down them all and look at it, uh, looks quite good. Uh, it can be much more targeted. You have an infinity of instruments. Uh, in most cases, the lags with which it works are easier to get the sense of than for monetary policy. So it looks great. It has a large set of tools. Uh, the issue is the lags are short, or relatively short, once it's implemented. And there is a process where which typically takes time. So the issue has been uh, for the last uh, 10 years uh, on you know, the fact that use right is, th is theoretical and not practical. And once implemented uh, is, is a big issue. Uh, there are decision lags, there are implementation lags, and then there is, we don't distinguish between the various lags, but there's another one, which is maybe not a lag, but a bias, which is a spending bias of fiscal policy. So for those reasons, most of the work on policy on fiscal versus money has been on monetary policy with an infinite number of very good papers refining inflation targeting in all kinds of ways and basically nearly no work 
on fiscal policy, the idea was, well, we have automatic stabilizers. Let's use them. Let's not even question them. And you made a remark about the fact that they came from other considerations. And so there hasn't been enough work. And I've always thought there was an imbalance there. And that I, I think in the current context, there is an even stronger reason to return to fiscal policy. And I'll argue that that means, for the most part, automatic stabilizers. I mean, there's the rules and the automatic stabilizers, and there's a conceptual separation between the two. I'll be focusing on automatic stabilizers. And the first one is limits to monetary policy. And we all understand that there is now a zero law abound, and it can, it, it can bind. Or the anticipation that it can bind is an issue. So that makes other things equal, might we policy less attractive or less useful uh, and gives more weight to fiscal. But on the other side, going the other way, uh, the fiscal situation is not very good. Uh, we have very high debt levels or debt ratios. Um, there's a worry about debt explosions, uh, which is leading governments, for example, in the current context to return to post-cyclical policies when growth slows down uh, then you cut the budget. And we had an example of this in France in the last two weeks, where the Minister of Finance said, well, we're revising the growth rate down from 1.4 to 1, and therefore I'm going to make cuts of 10 billion this year, 20 billion next year. It's part of a larger uh, set of measures, but it's clearly pro-cyclical, not the right one. And the other thing is politics, which is I think there's a higher risk of misuse, we have more populist governments coming to power. Traditionally, populism a la Latin America was that fiscal uh, became a big issue. It looks like the new brand is a bit different and more responsible, but I still think that we have to worry about what they might do. So in the end, what is it that we do? So what I am going to argue is automatic stabilizers other way to use fiscal policy more and avoid these shortcomings that comes from higher debt and uh, and potential misuse. As Marco said, the stabilizers we have are accidental. They depend on basically the rate of taxation. Countries like France, in which the budget of a state is more than 50%, have stronger automatic stabilizers than countries which have 30%, say or so. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for having them, but maybe we can do better. So I think what we can do is not fiddle with uh, tax rates in general or reduce the size of a government by 20% in order to get stronger or weaker stabilizers. What we have to do is think about what I would call quasi-automatic uh, stabilizers, which are triggered. These are basically stabilizers, measures which are triggered by some aggregate variable, which may be output, which may be unemployment. Uh, so they depend on the publication, or at least the measurement of some variable, as opposed to the truly automatic stabilizers where nobody needs to know anything, it just happens uh, by itself. But that's what we have to think about. They can be of two types, right? There can be continuous functions of some published variable. So you could have unemployment benefits be more generous when unemployment is lower, tighter when it's higher, for example. Or they could be discontinuous, which is the way a few which is, exist have this form. But basically, when unemployment goes above some level, then you know unemployment duration, for example, is increased. But conceptually, they are you know, within the same family. So the rest of the, of the slides is to face two challenges in thinking about how to design them. And I'm going to be thinking about conceptual challenges. There's a whole set of issue, which is even if I convinced you that it's worth doing, then the implementation is always complicated, but I'm going to leave this aside. There's a fairly large literature on, 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 on those issues. So the first one, I think, which is essential is in the current context, you want automatic stabilizers to be debt neutral, namely to have no long run effect on debt. And that way you can use them because they don't actually kind of make the debt position worse. They're neutral with respect to that. But you have to think about how to design them. And then the other is, as I think Marco hinted, what they stabilize typically is output 
or unemployment. What we need to stabilize conceptually is the output gap or the unemployment gap, which means when there are supply shocks, you may not want to basically try to increase output if it's the result of lower productivity. And so can we design them so that they aim more at the output gap than at the output or the unemployment gap than the output? Okay, so <clears throat> let me talk a bit about the two challenges. So how do you make the automatic, I'm going to say automatic stabilizers rather than quasi-automatic. Mm -hmm. The first ones, uh, and if I look at some of the quasi-automatic stabilizers which exist, they tend to be asymmetric by design. For example, in the US, when unemployment exceeds some level, then unemployment duration is longer. But there is nothing on the other side. When unemployment is lower, there is no decrease in duration. So that on net, they basically, if you keep using them, they contribute to that. They just work on one side, they don't offset. So that's to be avoided, I think, in the design of, uh, of stabilizers. The second is, you may or may not believe that, but I, I believe cycles are asymmetric in the sense that there's, there's a nice paper by Amy uh, Nakamura on plucking cycles, which is basically the shocks are negative shocks. It's very rare that there's a great positive shock. Most of the shocks is something bad happens. So if you have this view, then you have basically all the shocks are negative, and then you try to go back to the flat part. In which case, if you intervene when there is a shock, you want, again, to maintain that neutrality to be slightly tighter, even in normal times, because that's the only way you're going to basically offset what you're spending uh, in, these, uh, in, these, in these drops of output. And then the last point is that take a world in which the cycles are symmetric, the measures are symmetric, and you basically, so when there's a positive shock, you're tighter, when there's a negative shock, you're loser. If it's symmetric, that's not going to be enough to imply that neutrality. And the relevant equation is this one. This is the part of that, this is not all of that, this is the part of that which is due to the automatic stabilizers. So epsilon is this white noise, which sometimes you do something, sometimes you don't. Well, you can see that that does not necessarily converge, right? Uh, it, it, if one plus r minus g, which is the relevant uh, variable uh, uh, parameter here is positive, which is taken to be the standard case, then each shock is going to build up. Uh, you know, if it's positive, it's going to keep increasing at the rate one plus r minus g, negative same. Even if r minus g is equal to zero, then the debt associated with the stabilizer will be a random walk, right? And sometimes positive, sometimes negative. So it's not going to disappear. It's uh, in expected value, it's zero, but once it's off, it's off. And so what you have to do when you build an automatic stabilizer is put what Henning Bone, in an old paper, but an important paper, basically did, which is for that as a whole, have a feedback, right? Basically, you want to have a term, which is the last term at the end of the last equation, in which if you have used the automatic stabilizer a lot, then you can be, you have to be less generous now in the use of it. And that is the only way you're going to get D to go to zero in expected value over time. <laughs> which means that if you've been using the automatic stabilizers, there has been a lo long periods of crisis, you have to be less generous, not only to offset it, but beyond that uh, in order to uh, get that neutrality. I think it's important because the image of automatic stabilizers mm -hmm. is that they just add to that. And that has to be avoided in the current context. The second issue is that we want to stabilize the output gap. So Y minus Y star, not y and the same thing u minus u star not 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 u now how do we do this well that's a question of how much of the movements in the variable we look at which is output or unemployment is due to transitory shocks demand shocks say and how much is due to supply shocks right when it's a productivity shock you probably don't want uh, to stabilize fully output that would be a mistake but y star has changed so what do you do? I think in practice, there are only two potential triggers. 
The first one is output, and the second is unemployment. So we have to find a way of knowing how much movements in output or movements in unemployment are due to demand shocks and how much to. So this goes back to work, which I did when I was a kid, uh, the Blanchard Quad decomposition, in which we basically allowed, we said there are two shocks. Demand shocks don't have long run effects. Supply shocks have long run effects. We can identify them and then look at their contribution. So I have redone this, I've updated it. And the conclusion is that, at least according to that decomposition, the proportion of output, which is due to transitory shocks, over eight quarters, so two years out, the normal <clears throat> shock, uh, is, is only 10, 25%. Most of the movement in output, according to that uh, methodology, is that it is uh, 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 due to supply shocks, which you should not try to uh, to upset. If you do the same thing for unemployment, it looks as if much more of a movement in unemployment is due to transitory shocks. So if you accept that mapping between transitory and demand and permanent and supply, then you get the answer that you should use unemployment as a trigger, not, not output. At the bottom of the page, I indicate that there are many reasons to doubt uh, that uh, methodology. <clears throat> demand shocks can have permanent effects. This is hysteresis, it can happen. Maybe it's not very big, maybe we can ignore it, but that would be permanent effects of demand shocks. Supply shocks can have transitory effects and no longer effects. I think COVID is a very good example of that. Enormous short run effect, maybe some long run effect, but probably small relative. So you can see why the methodology may not be best, but I think the quantitative conclusion is you have to think about what the trigger is going to be. And my conclusion is quantitatively unemployment. Okay. Now, the question is, now we have a trigger, what should we use? So we have all these fiscal measures. We can use taxes on consumers, we can use uh, taxes on firms, and so on and so on. And if you think about each one, they basically vary in how much they work for an income effect and how much they work for a substitution effect. So if you think about unemployment benefits, to a first approximation, they work for income effects. People are unemployed are largely liquidity constrained. You give them more money, they spend it. If you think about a VAT, a temporary change in the VAT, that's very much more a substitution effect. And with the addition of debt neutrality, which is going to, you're going to undo it. This means that when you're very generous this period, you're going to be tougher in the future. That amplifies the substitution effect. Um, the investment tax credit is the same thing on the firm side. And I had a paper with uh, Larry Summers a few years ago on that. Okay, so I think we understand the use of unemployment benefits, but I'm going to focus on those which work mostly for substitution effects. And then the question is, okay, so let's think VAT. Uh, How long, when you announce that you're doing a decrease in VAT in order to stimulate demand, uh, how long do you announce it for? Do you say, well, it's there for a year, and then we have set it, or even more, we basically increase it in order to make it that neutral, or do we say, we'll see, or do we say five years? And clearly, the effect is going to be strongest the shorter the duration, and therefore, then there's a big issue, and I think that's specific to fiscal rather than monetary policy, which is the role of discretionary policy in this context. If you think discretionary fiscal policy is a non-starter because of misuse, then you don't want it to come to the rescue because it's going to be wrong. If you think it's mostly lags, implementation lags, uh, uh, political lags, then it, keeps, it comes, and the cavalry comes after, say, two years. Good. Means use of the table. Good. Yes, <laughs> the table. Uh, so, I think the answer is is discretionary policy in the act, in the end coming, maybe too late or late, and in which case all you need is kind of a bridge, which is between the time now 
and the time when it can do the job right, you put stabilizers, or you think it shouldn't come, it's not going to come, and then you want it for longer because you don't want to stop a tax subsidy in the middle of a of a recession if it lasts more than a year. So my sense is, and uh, that's based on, on these graphs, which I will not have time to describe, but basically they describe the effect in three recessions of the automatic stabilizers, the contribution of the automatic stabilizers, and the contribution of discretionary monetary policy. The stabilizers are in orange, the discretionary policy is in green. And what you see is that at least for these three episodes, uh, the cavalry came, basically. It came and it came big, which means that there was just a need at the beginning, but not later. Now, how general it is, that's something on which I'm working. These might be accidents in not representative, but. Why is it that I can't get to? Is it because I've, ex I've used all my time? No, 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 no. You still have a yeah, but like, uh, uh, ah, one or two. Minutes. Good. Okay, I have not, a couple of minutes. Okay, good. Okay, so the last two slides are looking at at the VAT, and uh, the math is basically that you know consumers are trading, buying now or buying later. Depends on the interest rate. Depends on the discount rate. As soon both cannot change. For example, we had the ZLB. Then you can make them trade using the VAT rate. So X is the VAT rate. You can decrease it now, and then you can increase it later. And that plays just like an interest rate, right? It basically, and I think in many ways, it's more salient. And you basically say you can buy a car at a VAT rate of 3% less, and it will be 3% more next year. I think that works better than reading that the Fed has decrease the interest rate by 3% if it can do it. But that's to be discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, this works mostly for substitution effects. If people are liquidity constrained, then it works for income effects, which is the next line. So the question is, given that, what do you want to do? And again, I think the issue there is, for how long do you do it for? Do you announce it as a contingent end which is when output has recovered or unemployment has recovered, it stops and we'll find out when. <laughs> or do you pre-announce uh, so that people can plan better? And then at what rate do you want to undo it? That's an important part because I've argued that you don't want just always to be too generous. You have to be tougher. And you can undo it very quickly, the period after, or you can do it over a long period in which you slightly increase the VAT rate. And I would argue that you probably have to do it slowly over a long period. So the rate that you choose after the crisis or the recession uh, is basically a bit higher for a long time. <clears throat> I don't know what it does that. Next thing, please. It really doesn't want to go to the next slide. Huh? <laughs> maybe, maybe because now. Time is up. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know what to do. Ah, I good. You are using the wrong button. I was using this one. Okay. Um, good. Okay. More discussions, but I think that's where that's where I'm now working, and I think that well, the, the point I would make is about the value of uh, elasticity of substitution. <laughs> now we tend to think it's not very high. But because we're thinking about consumption of non-durables, in effect, if it's consumption of durables, then it is very attractive to buy a car now mm -hmm. if the price is lower, even if you're not going to use it much this year, but you have it for next year. So I suspect that sigma, which is the relevant elasticity, may, may well be greater than one. In which case, what happens actually is that the automatic stabilizers uh, increase revenue for the state when they are used, and then they decrease it later, which is a bit <clears throat> counterintuitive, but that's what comes out. Uh, there are various issues, and one which is very relevant is the uh, next to last line, which will be the second session, which is, if we now think about the EU, and the countries are thinking about using this, is this EU-wide? And if not, what are the tensions which come from one country using it and the others not, which is related to work by... Uh, Emmanuel Fari on fiscal devaluations. Uh, different adjustment for different weights. Let me just conclude. 
I hope that I have moved your prior a little bit uh, in the direction of this is something we should be working on. And there hasn't been enough work. Something can probably be done uh, and uh, would be very useful. There is a large parallel with the Taylor wall, which was trying to find a way, except that there you have very little flexibility. An automatic stabilizer is an automatic stabilizer. You can't change that. But there is an important difference, which is this, this discretionary policy aspect. In my trade policy, you don't have that. There's a Taylor wall, and if you stick to it, that's it. Here, you basically have measures until you can use discretionary fiscal policy, and maybe there the EU rules allow you to do more, uh, uh, but quite, you know, with some lag. The last point I would make is that I think it's a bit like inflation targeting discussions yeah, 30 years ago. It sounds a bit exotic, uh, but... You know, on my trade policy, I think QE would have been seen as largely exotic. Negative nominal rates would have been seen as extremely exotic, and we've used them. So I would say that at this stage, the marginal benefit of people working on this would be high. Thanks. Thank you so much. We will take that uh, encouragement to be very much open-minded about what uh, can be done uh, with us. And uh, it's not by design, but Florentines are overrepresented at this panel because also Luigi Federico Signorini, uh, I understand, uh, grew up in Florence. Uh, he's uh, Managing Director, Director General at the Bank of Italy. You have the floor. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I have to... Oh, I also need the... Okay. I have to start with a set of disclaimers or really apologies, really. First apologies that uh, my slides are very poor. The, the only excuse is that a few people here in the, here in the, in the, in the audience may testify to the fact that it's been pretty busy in the past <laughs> couple of days. So uh, I, I assure you that I can I can do better, but uh, you, you have to to, to make do with, with what uh, with what I have. Um, Second disclaimer is that, uh, as you say, as you see, the um, the the title uh, here is uh, fiscal stabilizer, fiscal rules, and fiscal union, which means that I'm I have the temptation, at least, to uh, carry over a, a bit into the 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 theme of the next session. Um, we will see, and, and also depending on uh, how much time it, it 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 takes. But as I think uh, uh, Olivier Blanchard just said, it's difficult to, uh, in, in the European context, it's difficult to talk about national stabilizers without making reference to the uh, to the to the European framework. And of course, the, the the third concern is that I just speak immediately after Professor Blanchard. So it's it's a a, 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 a tough situation, uh, and the, the only comfort is that uh, I'll be saying many things that are similar to, to what uh, Olivier has just, just said, so um, um, run a lesser risk of being completely seen as an idiot. So, um, first, this, uh, where's, where's the, okay, thank you. Uh, which is the right one? You, you the one that. which has no marking. Yeah, you move ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Fiscal stabilizer. So um, the first point, uh, fiscal um, measures of stabilizer, the, the, the cycle should be the three T's, timely, temporary, and targeted. And I think in this perspective, um, I slightly disagree with what Marco said at the beginning. Automatic stabilizers are preferable to discretionary measures. They do not suffer from the lags due to legislative approval and implementation. They do not need explicit action to be terminated. Many of the channels that, uh, through which they operate are inherently benefiting those uh, most in need, so um, timely, uh, temporary, and targeted. Um, 
And the li literature also points to potential political economy biases, effective selective discretionary action. Of course, the, the Marcus says it's, it's not instantaneous and it's not optimal. Then, but I, I suppose that there are few things that are completely op optimal in this world. At least you you have to 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 look at the at the comparison with uh, with the alternative, which is a discretionary uh, stabilization measures. Mm. Um, automatic fiscal stabilization is explicitly provided by cycle sensitive budgetary items, and such items are. Uh, driven by the cyclical macroeconomic basis, unemployment for the unemployment benefits, mm -hmm. household income for personal taxation, turnover for VAT, profits for corporate taxes. By the way, uh, the, the the relationship between turnover and VAT in terms of instantaneity is, is, is a practically as instantaneous as you can get in 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 in, in this uh, in this in this field so they react promptly to a shock and the micro level they go to those that are more directly hit in a progressive tax system by the way provided inflation is low personal income tax revenues also typically decline more than gdp as some households fall into a lower tax bracket and this provides a an additional short term boost Implicit out of stabilization, however, is also provided by non-cyclical items, especially on the spending side. Most existing government expenditures, such as wages, transfer, intermediate consumption, hardly react to short-run changes in output. So they tend to rise as a share of GDP in recessions and declining booms. The case has been made over and over in the literature that with very large and persistent demand shock that the risk the risk of hysteresis effects may justify recourse to discretionary fiscal measures however any dis <clears throat> sorry any discretion interventions would need to be carefully crafted to avoid unintended distortion uh, provide for appropriate sunset clauses so that policies given the usual decision lags uh, do not do, do not end up being out of phase of the cycle or have an undue longer term impact on the equilibrium of public finances, as Olivier just said. So the, these conditions are not always easy to say the least to stick to 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 to, to stick to in practice. An intermediate possibility is to make any non-automatic fiscal response to very large shocks not fully discretionary. That is to say, to have specific measures triggered by predefined exceptional circumstances so that's that's exactly the the, the topic of the, the the previous speech the, the idea I, I should say it's not totally new it's back to one of the earliest uh, um, yeah there we are uh, the, um, one of the earliest paper on the subject Musgrave and Miller in 1948 the flexibility of the tax system might be increased if provisions was made for automatic adjustment tax rate with changes in income but this was all hardly be called uh, uh, built-in flexibility in the usual sense of the term. However, it's been explored and it's being explored more rigorously in recent uh, years. Basically, the, the idea consists in changing the parameters of fiscal policy, for instance, the generosity of unemployment benefits or tax rate for a period of time when one of more uh, business cycle indicators like the unemployment rate, which is preferable, as Olivier just said, or the output gap exceed certain thresholds. This approach uh, reduces the delays in policy making uh, implicit in fully discretionary measures. One can actually think of several objections. First, defining property indicators and thresholds, for instance, may be tricky, both on theoretical grounds, and I think that the discussion that uh, Olivier Blanchard just, uh, has just uh, presented uh, in, 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 in explains that and practical grounds. Um, issues of statistical measurement can arise. The possibility of exposed tampering with parameters may reintroduce some of the problems inherent in pure discre discretionary action. Still, I understand that uh, um, an arrangement of this type is actually in, in, in place, at least in the case of the US uh, in employment benefits scheme that has also been mentioned. So I do think that it might be useful to explore the possibility of making use of a similar arrangement in a, especially in a supranational con context with an open mind, with a uh, pragmatic attitude. But now let me let me go to fiscal rules. Um, 
because that that's the the way where we uh, where we are and that's the 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 uh, burn on contention about much of the um, debate of of uh, on, on fiscal stabilization now let me start by stating a very uh, simple fact that fiscal rules in monetary union are needed to ensure the stability of the area by preventing harmful spillovers caused by public finance tensions in some countries. And for these reasons, members are required to pursue sound forward-looking fiscal strategies to guarantee long-term sustainability. This, and, and this is the, 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 the crucial point, this will make public finances in each country more resilient to negative shocks thanks both to the fiscal space accumulated in good times and to the confidence of markets given by credible long-term commitments. While rules originate as a reciprocal guarantee among members of the union, they are also a useful reference for political deliberations in each member state. Now, pursuing these aims requires a careful design, and that, that might be an understatement. The crux of the matter consists in operationalizing the concept of forward-looking and long-term. Uh, one would like to have um, rules that are strong enough to ensure that extra fiscal resources are accumulated in good times, but flexible enough to avoid uh, imposing undue pro-cyclical fiscal uh, contractions in, in bad times. It Let me say that uh, um, the pro-cyclical impact of inflexible fiscal rules can be overstated, especially in a crisis. When a government faces a loss of the market's confidence in long-term sustainability of its finances, there is no flexibility in formal rules that can spare it the need for a for forceful action. Still, adequately accounting for the conjunctural situation remains a, a desirable feat. Ah, in, instability to, to the utmost instability. We'll, we'll try to use to, to use to, to use the. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, multitasking. So, multitasking, very good. Um, adequately accounting for the conjunctural situation, as I was saying, remains a desirable feature of um, effective rules. Thank you so much. Um, easy said than, than done. No, nobody says says that devising such rules is, a, is an easy task. There's a potentially vast choice of indicators, parameters, procedures, institutional structures, all of which has pros and cons, and one has to be prepared to accept second best solutions, also taking into account the need for uh, reaching tricky political agreements. Europe, of course, has long had such rules and, and long had a, a li lively debate about them. And this is not the occasion for a retrospective assessment of existing rules, not, not even from the, the specific point of view of uh, uh, stabilization policies. Let me just say that with all the limits, all the complications, and I think an unbalance they're likely to have positively contributed to budget processes, not least by providing, as I said, reference points and calling for improved domestic procedures, including at the constitutional level. Still, especially after the COVID crisis called for a suspension, there was a consensus that the system had become too complex and unworkable and that a reform was necessary. This process is now coming to a close, as Marco said at the beginning, following the political agreement that was uh, reached a few weeks ago. Now, a positive element of the new framework appears to be its explicit medium-term orientation, which entails a full-fledged debt sustainability analysis performed by Commission. The reform also, and that's the, 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 the second big thing, that the reform also provides for more room for bargaining between the European Commission and each member state. Now, this is welcome to the extent that it has the potential for increased national ownership, as the saying goes, of the plans, and it does create some useful flexibility. However, it may also, it may also imply a highly politicized process and the way it will actually work in practice cannot be fully anticipated. So I, what, what I think I can say is that a constructive, far-sighted attitude on all sides will be essential for this approach to, to succeed. Numerical safeguard, I think, uh, yeah, there we are. Numerical safeguards are also envisaged 
And as, as you know, the final compromise includes a minimum structural budget target, 1.5% of GDP, and a minimum annual debt reduction target up to 1% of GDP, depending on the starting point. The role of the 3% deficit threshold has never been questioned. Uh, experience will show how, uh, again, this set of safeguards is actually going to work. In principle, let me say that having safeguards in the procedure is is a bit, for, for those who have been exposed to, to, to the issues about uh, um, banking supervision, it, to me, uh, having safeguards in the procedure is a bit like having output flows and leverage ratios in banking regulation. If the conceptually superior process, that is to say risk sensitive models in banking or a well-developed realistic sustainability models and effective medium term plans in public finance, if those, if those superior processes work as intended and if rule of thumb thresholds are well chosen, the latter rule of thumbs, the rule of thumb rules can be seen as a kind of rough guardrails, guardrails useful to maintain the operations of the main mechanism within reasonable limits. But again, experience will tell. It's difficult to, to, to see at this point. And let me do a very quick uh, point about uh, fiscal union to conclude. If a significant central budget uh, were in place, having simpler rules at the national level would be possible, easier. Any residual procyclical effect could be counteracted by a system of EU level stabilizers automatically or possibly semi automatic. For common shocks, shocks that are common to uh, the, the, the whole of most of the Union, one substantial advantage of such an arrangement would be the possibility of simplifying the rules and making them more transparent. And I think that this, the, the, the latter point is a, an important issue in, in, um, in practice and in also in the public debate. For idiosyncratic shocks, it would, this system would additionally entail the benefits of mutual insurance. National fiscal policies can only spread the effect of a shock on private uh, consumption and GDP over time. A common EU-level stabilizing mechanism could also provide a degree of budget insurance against country-specific shocks, that is to say, across member countries. Of course, no explicit, uh, no explicit uh, mutual insurance scheme is conceivable without uh, safeguards against moral hazard, opportunistic behavior, or stacked odds. Uh, however, I think that tools can be devised to mitigate moral hazard, to equate, that, that's crucial, to equate ex, ex ante expected benefits. There is a, a, a body of work done at the Bank, Bank of Italy that showed that similar, mechanism, similar mechanisms can be devised. So I think that the economic case for a reasonable degree of EU-level fiscal stabilization, in my opinion, fundamentally stands. The, the more automatic, frankly, the better. In political terms, of course, I'm, that's that's not my, my province, but I'm no, under no illusion that this would be a an easy or a quick route, route to take. My view is that uh, uh, an increased EU level fiscal capacity with some stabilizing effect could be useful, maybe may it become feasible in time. We'll see. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you also for being well within uh, the time. Um, just a couple of remarks before uh, moving on to our discussions uh, about the quasi-automatic uh, stabilizers uh, that you were mentioning, Professor Blanchard. If we think about the last recessions that we have experienced, they went very often far beyond what was considered even plausible before. So we really need to have tools that are able to tackle what uh, seemed uh, unthinkable on, on one side. But again, if we think about the crisis that we have experienced, and, and I'm I'm thinking about, of course, the, 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 
the, the, the okay. euro crisis okay. uh, especially okay. covid and also ukraine and the energy crisis they never left the economy looking like it was before even covid think about supply chains etc so uh, how we think uh, in terms of stabilizers that don't freeze a situation that doesn't exist anymore it's also a, a big question and and probably uh, semi-automatic stabilizers can help in that direction but uh, I would uh, move to our discussants uh, Professor Royal Betzma from the University of Amsterdam each minute uh, uh, 10 minutes each uh, for both of you Can I... uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so also the disclaimer from my side as member of the EFB that um, you know it's my own personal views. Um, now let me just see. This. I don't know. In the, in the end, I was able to do that. Let me try. I have to use more force, uh, apparently. So let me say a few words about automatic stabilizers in general. So first of all, thanks a lot for having me here. I think it's a, it's a very nice panel. And uh, let me say a few words about automatic stabilizers, then about what I think is still possible in terms of automatic stabilization within the uh, new EU a fiscal rule book, and then a few words about beyond automatic stabilizers, for example, the quasi-automatic stabilization. Um, as um, in, in Olivier's slides, he mentioned about the accidental effect of uh, accidental stabilization effect of the automatic stabilizers, and they are not designed for stabilization. But if we think of them, think in the most simple way, or the you know kind of the the pure textbook, if you have a negative demand shock, uh, revenues fall, spending increases, and that dampens the demand effect. Um, things become more complicated with supply shocks. And I think here it's not always clear what is the effect of the tax transfer system. And so, for example, we had an increase in energy prices. Revenues fell, but I'm not completely sure because, for example, in the Netherlands, I think actually because of the tax system, revenues increased. Um, then, um, on the other hand, disposable income fell, and uh, you know there was a rise in spending that then um, you know had a dampening effect. Well, dampening effect actually because of the supply constraints, uh, probably most of the effect just went into inflation. Um, and the question here is, so where do the shocks come from and which shocks will dominate? And maybe in the future, we have a dominance of supply shocks. Um, then there are other factors that play a role in the effectiveness of automatic stabilizers. So for example, the level of the public debt. This is also a reason why as e European Fiscal Board, we've been emphasizing that during good periods, countries should build up uh, buffers, which they can use then in uh, during bad periods. Yeah? If we have, if you have extremely high debt, and there's a negative shock, then maybe households will just increase savings and uh, in anticipation of higher taxes, and that might undo the effect of automatic stabilizers. Um, now. What is my assessment under the new fiscal rule book? Um, I think a lot of the effects are still unclear, but um, okay, let, let's just try to look at it in detail. We have the net primary expenditure indicator, that is the intermediate indicator. That's kind of the you know this kind of steering instrument of the governments. So that's expenditure net of discretionary uh, revenue measures, interest expenditure, cyclical component of unemployment benefit, co-financing EU funds, and on-offs. And maybe I forget some because it's become quite a complicated formula. But I think that still 
there is room for the automatic stabilizer. So for example, unexpected fluctuations in revenues would just be absorbed yeah. in the deficit. Um, uh, cyclical unemployment benefits are excluded, but there's also a control account and the control account allows for some deviation of the uh, from the uh, you know from the ex ante that expenditure path and finally there are also escape clauses and so um there's a general escape clause there's a national escape clause and um if uh, if uh, you know um so so countries could but that could could use that in the case of very severe shocks and um, you know, if they adhere to the structural, if they adhere to the net expenditure path, then they will reduce the structural deficit to a point that is, you know, where it's sufficiently low, and that leaves room for the absorption of the shocks in case there is, uh, in case uh, an escape clause is in invoked. Um, this is a very complicated diagram, but that is how you flow through the, um, you know, through this new system, through the new fiscal rulebook. In any case, on the far left hand side, uh, for countries with high debt, you know, they, um, uh, well, you see that the structural primary deficit has to be reduced at a certain at a certain uh, rate. Um, a couple of options beyond uh, given automatic stabilizers. Uh, active stabilization, um, I would say that in the case of extreme shocks, um, there are still there is still scope for active stabilization. Uh, Quasi-automatic stabilization that Olivier was uh, discussing, discussing elaborately and uh, in the design of tax transfer systems. Now, let me go to active stabilization. Of course, the problem with active stabilization is that fine tuning is difficult. Um, it is difficult to assess the state of the economy in real time. Uh, I've done work on that, and you know you have quite big revisions uh, of initial data. Um, there are decision and implementation lags, and it also takes some time for um, you know the active stabilization to feed through in the economy. But this really also depends on the instruments that are used, and then there is of course uncertainty in the size on the size of the effects. And so, for example, the size of the multipliers. Um, and and the multipliers are also dependent on on the on the state uh, of the economy. So active stabilization, I would say, is not advisable in the presence of moderate shocks because then the fine tuning issues they dominate. But under very extreme shocks, I think of you know the COVID shock. Um, I think there is no doubt about real-time assessment. Uh, and so it was very clear that this was, you know, immediately that this was a huge shock. And then there is, uh, you know, an, an argument for active stabilization. And so, for example, the U.S. government sent checks to, to households, although the European governments work mostly through supporting firms. And... I guess that you know these checks to households they worked immediately. Um, so I think generally speaking, there's a need to improve the real time assessment of 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 the state, for example, through the collection of high frequency data, et cetera. And you know the technical possibilities are increasing. Um, quasi automatic stabilization, a couple of examples were given. So for example, the unemployment benefit, which could move with the recession, but also uh, the VAT. And this is uh, tricky in my view. And I want to point to something that has nothing to do with the cycle, but uh, I refer to the case of the Netherlands, where actually we have an automatic indexation of the retirement age to life expectancy. And that is, I think, a good thing because the formula has been set and there is no repeated political discussion. It's it's accepted or mostly accepted. And so um, in a way, such a formula is kind of a commitment uh, device. So, But in any case, um, regarding quasi-automatic stabilizers, there are a couple of potential complications. Uh, first of all, um, you know, you have a formula and the question is whether you can calibrate the formula sufficiently precisely to ensure that there is no drift in the public debt 
over the over the cycle and these formulas they will be based on estimates and so there will always be some inaccuracy um uh, sometimes so what is the termination condition uh, so in the case of VAT and I think Olivier also referred to that in the case of a VAT reduction what is the what is the condition under which the reduction is re is uh, you know is taken away um, because we don't know how long will a recession be and so it could well be that you say okay we are going to raise the VAT after one year but then the economy might, might still be in a, in a bad shape um, so and then finally um, there is of course if you have a formula and you know the formula can go in, in two ways one is become more generous under certain conditions and then you know you it would work in the other way under uh, maybe an, an uh, you know when the economy is in boom then there may always be political pressure to maintain the uh, temporary generosity so one would need to have kind of rules that i think should be uh, formulas that are, should be very simple and so uh, you know that would be uh, increased uh, robustness finally uh, so uh, i mean and then in the design of tax transfer systems as um, as was already mentioned automatic stabilizers are in a way accidental. And so, of course, if you have a bigger government, you would Cetris Paribus, you would have more automatic stabilization, at least uh, regarding demand shocks, but of course you also have incentives, effects, et cetera. But still within a given size of the government, I think that um, you know there are design issues. Uh, and uh, so for example, take the case of automatic wage indexation that has been abolished, I think, in almost all countries except for Belgium. And so if you have, uh, you know, if inflation goes up, wages go up, demand goes up, and you get into this into this cycle. So I think that, you know, when it comes to, you know, enhancing automatic stabilizers, it might be good to look at the indexation mechanisms in, in the economy and maybe at other arrangements uh, more broadly. So thank you for listening. Nielsen, uh, who is a senior economic advisor at Unicredit, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, I, I didn't bring in these slides and I'm very happy because now I don't have to display my incapability of, uh, of maneuvering them. Um, but also thanks uh, for inviting me. I'm, so I'm, I'm an economist in a commercial bank and uh, to be perfectly honest, when Marco sent me a note, I hadn't thought about automatic stabilizers since I left the World Bank 25 years ago or something to that effect. But um, helped by Olivier's uh, uh, slides in progress, I, I have read a lot about it the last couple of weeks and I thought a lot about it. So um, uh, I'm, it's going to be more questions really than answers. Uh, I'm going to say three things. First, um, I think conceptually it's almost a no-brainer. It's a, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, it's a, for all the reasons that we have heard. And I was going to ask, uh, I, I was going to add one more. Uh, Olivia wrote about and talked about the um, the risk of the zero lower bound, which is absolutely true. We don't know if we get back there again. But I'm going to add also the shock that I've had the last couple of years of seeing the ECB reaction to a massive terms of trade shock or supply shock, which... Those who see what I write, I've, I've been relatively critical of of the, the tough monetary policy adjustment. And I've been told that the reason for this is that you had to in order to anchor inflation expectations. There was no demand shock, right? I mean, look, total domestic demand in the Eurozone today is the same level as the end of 2019. Don't tell me there's a demand kind of element to inflation here. It's a supply shock. Now, if therefore we have learned now that monitor said that inflation targeting requires, even after all these years where credibility was perfect almost, it still requires a massive monetary policy tightening in order to anchor inflation expectations. Well, then monetary policy works slightly differently than I have thought it did. And I'm not going to make now a long discussion about whether that's right or wrong, but if that's the reality then monetary policy could become pro-cyclical or have been pro-cyclical de facto. We got, it's not a cycle, maybe it's a shock, right? But it is, 
So therefore, fiscal, the, the, the job for fiscal policy is a lot bigger, right? I mean, we have had the biggest monetary policy tightening in probably four or five decades to the biggest terms of trade shock in as long time. Like, that's unusual. That's not how we thought. And it was not how it started, right? So, uh, so uh, if this is correct, if broadly speaking, then that enhances further the need for fiscal policies <laughs> and, and automatic stabilizers in particular. But before I leave that first topic, it, the fiscal authorities deserve, in my opinion, credit also for the discretionary reaction to the crisis we have had, the COVID crisis and the and and the the terms of trade shock, right? So it's not like they didn't react, but maybe you could argue whether they reacted correctly. I certainly wrote papers, brief papers, that I thought the European fiscal discretionary fiscal reaction was better than the American. Sort of simply put, we put follow schemes or, or sort of various schemes in place to work schemes and what have you, while the American carpet bombed the economy with cash. Now, as I said, we have had no zero real growth in total domestic demand for four years, and the Americans have had seven, right? So maybe I'm wrong on what worked well, but, but leave that aside. Now, so conceptually, I'm, I'm, I'm sold. I'm completely on board. My second point is I, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, which are really more questions about the practical designs, uh, and I know it's work in progress, but here are the things that I sort of struck me that I thought about. Debt neutrality, obviously, uh, that is the case. And I, I work myself through your, your formulas, uh, Olivier, and I, I, I see them quite clearly. The problem, as you also said yourself, is that uh, the cycles are not symmetric. It doesn't seem that way. So a question just, and this is a question, is if, as I think is the case, that over the past, R has been smaller than G, doesn't it come back basically to that debt sustainability? Debt, debt doesn't grow if, if that keeps to keep being the case. So the question is whether when you one day design the details of this, is it worthwhile building in a debt stabilizer in it? Uh, uh, maybe or maybe not. Second point, uh, you picked unemployment. Uh, I, I'm, I, I can't think of a better one, um, even though employment and unemployment are lacking indicators in the cycle, right? So, but how can you get a hit of it in a sense? I don't know. But then I'm struggling, and this is again a question, I'm struggling uh, when I read through your chart, I, I I totally get the issue of, of uh, output versus output gap, given the fact that we don't have a clue what output gaps are and how they move and they get revised all the time by people who spend enormous amount, enormous amount of time on it. But the parallel into the labor market is that what is Nairo? I mean, and how do one think about that in a sense? Where what is the right unemployment level? And and this relates also to Europe and the next discussion. Is it the same? It's not the same for, for all countries. So so how do one it's easy to say unemployment rates, and I think maybe that is the simple and the right way of doing it, but but how do one relate to uh, the different NIROs? Um, um then the, uh, the the final one, uh, which I just wanted to sort of say, I I think personally that the simple one one trick, I mean one uh, thing that triggers it, the VAT, is the best thing I can think about. Also, I thought uh, <laughs> for two weeks a lot about it, but said um, And and all I would say is I went back to look. Uh, we have quite a lot of experience in Germany with temporary VAT cuts. And they seem to work okay. Not not always. There may be other countries also, but that's the one I had in mind, and I could look at quite quickly. And it has sort of a nice intertemporal sort of movement. You people do accelerate some purchases, and then they wait a little bit. Maybe not the cars, but a lot of other things sort of, of have moved. Uh, I think they, it it varies a little bit of what period you're looking at, but certainly there is a a good degree of uh, in of um, of sort of intertemporal moves. Uh, so that's that seems to be a good one, and you want to keep it simple. Now, my third and final thing, uh, a couple of four points on pitfalls. Um, how do one differ? You have talked about already, and we have talked about it, but I want to, but I wrote it down. Uh, how do one differ uh, between the cycles and the structural changes? Right? How do one catch? That if uh, we are hit by a shock, uh, somebody mentioned it before. I think you also, right? Um, uh, certainly, it seems to me that we are heading into a period, or we are in a period now, of massive 
sort of supply shocks, that probably will continue. I, I think we will be not to the same extent we have had. But to think that we are in the sort of, in my my worldview is that we are out of the globalist, uh, globalization period into a deglobalization that causes a lot of new issues or so supply shocks. It can be oil tankers. It can be all sort of things. And how do, and if this is a structural shock, and how do you want to differ between the two? The second one is, how to deal with what I call here, my note, the weird ones. And the weird ones is what we have now. No growth, but full employment. Right. And um, I don't know exactly the answer to it. My colleague, Marco Valley wrote an excellent paper published earlier this week that took the this conundrum of, of the employment versus the output growth sector by sector down. And it actually, the only place where you have, have had employment growth faster than output is in the public service sector and in construction, which leads me, parenthesis, to say the risk of sort of a, a wage spiral doesn't seem very high to me. So, but this is so different. But it, but again, I mean, there will always be weird ones where sort of the relationships are not quite as we are used to think about it. And how do you react, react to that? Which leads me to the third one, and I'm looking over at Claire now, given where you're going. Uh, what is the risk of becoming an unreliable boyfriend? <laughs> not because not this before your time. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So so for those who don't know it, this was a British parliamentarian who called Mark Carney an unreliable boyfriend because he had committed to forward guidance as a sort of state contingent forward guidance, right? So you saw it's probably, I think I have the answer. It's not as important in fiscal policy as in monetary policy. But as a but having a central bank governor come out and say, we will not do until well, we have to this. And then have and then uh, I changed my mind. Thing that was what Pat McFadden, I think, was said. It's like kind of relaxed. Right? So so how? But so I don't know. It's more a question. Is this important? If in a in a sort of quasi automatic stabilizer world that uh, we got a weird one like that we have now, where we maybe should actually lower. I think lower that, but we don't do it because there is the triggers are not there, namely the unemployment numbers or the other way around. So, so how do one think about that? And then since I'm from the market, I, I the last one is, and that comes straight off the this issue of the triggers. We in the market, we will have a lot of fun with this. And I'm afraid we won't be constructive, right? This is the problem. So I'll give you an example of just sort of, just think conceptually about this. Um, let's say it's a normal cycle. Things are weakening. Unemployment starting to go up. And I'm just making this up. Say that you have, for in order to the trigger of lower VAT to be be uh, implemented, you need say three readings of unemployment at a certain coming through a threshold. When two of those have passed, and we are getting close to the time where the third one is, we were going to get a lot of people in the market saying, "Hmm, what is the chance that this will be triggered?" Um, and if the VAT is, we start to think the VAT will be triggered, a uh, VAT cut will be triggered, then the market who doesn't trade the VAT per se, they will say, hmm, this probably means that that we are lowering our expectation of monetary easing because the fiscal is stepping in now. If it does, that would think. So it's um so in that sense, the market, I'm not sure it's a lot and you need to worry about it. But that's the direction of trade, right? I mean, I think I think this is a at least worthwhile to keep in mind. And then if you take just to make, and that's my last point, to make the fun part, let's take this weird one we have now, the special situation of where monetary policy, I hope it's special, but maybe it's not, uh, and a one-off, where monetary policy has become, in my opinion, overly obsessed with inflation expectations. Let me say when I say overly uh, obsessed with it, it's not that I don't think inflation expectations are important, but I thought the very point of inflation expectations was that we anchor them, right? So we could sort of we can sort of persuade the world that it's going and it and it, they never got de anchored, right? So it's a, but say we are in a situation where we get some of these sort of supply shocks. Monetary policy needs to come out and say, no, no, we are we are anchoring, so we are tightening up here now. And as we have seen in, in, in borderline, the central bankers here around the table will dispute what I'm going to say now. But it felt in the market as periods where monetary policy communication and forward guidance, even if we don't have it, or were driven 
in, where, where the weight of the actual data on the table increased. I'm not saying that they steered anybody steered on actual inflation number, but it became a bit backward looking in a sense. We need to see these numbers more than what the forward looking part is. And said so the Fed, if you follow this this past week, did perfectly well. We have worse numbers here, but our forecasts are still so that we are kind of thing we're going to cut. So that's the how it used to be. If we were to be in this situation where actually you where the market believes that actual incoming numbers are important for that precise reason of of anchoring inflation expectations and you cut the VAT because in this situation some in the market would certainly say ah that's going to lower the HICP that means that inflation expectations are probably a little bit better anchored and then how do you then yeah, which is absolutely absurd right but it's like so my point here is just the market will react to automatic stabilizers if it is something that plays together with monetary policy. Thanks. Um, th thank you, Eric. Uh, also, thank, uh, thanks for making uh, a point that uh, you made me think uh, of what uh, Mahil Hagi said. I think it was uh, at the National Association of Business Economists in the US when, when he said, I don't really say that we need policy mix in Europe, but we do need it. And uh, and that's why it's so difficult to to have uh, stabilizers uh, purely at the national level. But this will be for the uh, second part of our discussion. Um, there are questions. I put on my glasses so I can see hands can raised. Uh, maybe shall we take uh, a, a couple of questions and then reactions? What, what do you think, uh, Mr. Gaspar? So, Olivier, as you know, I'm a great fan of uh, your research on automatic stabilizers. I believe it's very important. If I were to think about how uh, to extend automatic stabilizers, I would be looking not only at quasi-automatic stabilizers, I would actually be focusing on how to design insurance mechanisms in um, a new class of models that considers heterogeneous agents, it actually makes a tremendous amount of difference who gets support. And you may be able to serve macroeconomic uh, stabilization at the same time that you actually target the most vulnerable. That's something that is probably uh, worth uh, exploring. On occasion, as you know, I uh, write a paper because I happen not to agree with something that you say. And uh, some years ago, I did that uh, to show that um, uh, public debt shocks are actually very strongly asymmetric and actually much more asymmetric than business cycles. So you have a residual over and above, you could explain, uh, from uh, business cycles. You may want to look at that evidence. It seems to fit your argument uh, quite well. Now, I cannot... Uh, not disagree with you on something, so let me do it now. If I were evaluating the type of intertemporal policy that you suggest for VAT, I would definitely not be focusing mostly on revenue effects. Because remember, if you have this very large elasticity, it means that your quasi-automatic stabilizer is actually delivering exactly when you want it to deliver. And the fact that you have a drop in revenues in the future is actually okay as well, because at that point in time, the budget is absorbing a part of the very strong drop in private spending. So to me, it does seem that you get exactly what you're looking for. Well, I shouldn't be asking any questions, but uh, because this is not at all my field, but I'm curious about something very general, which is how has your thinking, as you speak about these things, changed because of the financial crisis, because of COVID? It, I didn't recognize anything particular, any particular attention. It's only pretty much what I used to hear before these two events. So I mean, Eric mentioned some things about the, you know, the the COVID, but especially financial crisis. And I'm interested in you 
that because I think we can get one soon again. And we will again be surprised and we will again puzzle over why we didn't see it coming. And uh, and it relates a lot to how perfect you get with the risk sharing because when you have debt and you really diversify debt, that is a prescription eventually for financial crisis. Because unlike stock markets, if you diversify perfectly debt, they all go down at the same time. They, they also go in the, in the stock market, but nothing happens is the difference. But debt is very different because it has a second leg that has to be repaid. So you get more liquidity when you diversify until you get no liquidity at all. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. Um, I, I was working at the French Treasury when the uh, countercyclical unemployment benefit system was introduced. And uh, I must say that at that time, uh, well, first, countercyclical benefit, uh, well, it's from a political point of view, it was quite hard. Uh, but the, the main argument was not uh, macro. Uh, it was rather uh, the micro uh, of uh, the labor market, namely um, uh, matching models, the fact that when unemployment is high, then if you put pressure of one unemployed to look for a job, then there is a, ne a negative externality on the other ones because um, uh, jobs are scarce, whereas this uh, negative externality disappears when unemployment is low. So it's, it's a, it was an argument in terms of, uh, of the matching uh, of, uh, on the labor market rather than on a macro. Of course, we were taking the macro argument, but it was only secondary and also, well, I would say, third, because the second was rather, or maybe the first, uh, a budgetary argument to, to, cut, uh, to, well, to cut unemployment uh, benefit generosity on average. Uh, so it was a good time to do it because unemployment was low at that time. Uh, so uh, then the trigger, uh, there were discuss long discussions about the trigger. And uh, the problem with GDP is, um, the major problem with GDP is a revision. So it's revised several times. Uh, so it's unreliable. Uh, unemployment is uh, more reliable, although it's lagging behind. And it's even worse because you are not going to tell the unemployed uh, two months before the end, oh, well, oh, sorry, it's already do uh, finished because we are in good times. Uh, so you, you need to apply it to uh, the new uh, unemployed, which means that you even lag more. Um, so there was, a, in fact, it's asymmetric because if the situation uh, deteriorates, and so th those who are already unemployed can get an extra six months, whereas if the situation improves, um, uh, you, 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 those who are already unemployed will not uh, see their um, benefits uh, being suddenly cut. Uh, so it's asymmetric, which makes the fiscal <laughs> equation uh, worse. But on the on, on average, so it's still. The, it's it's still under the the evaluation is still underway. It's going to be interesting to 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 see uh, the outcome. What I saw is quite positive, uh, in fact. Uh, uh, finally, on on VAT, um, it's very nice. It's quick. It's it's convincing in terms of the real the real interest the interest rate argument is very convincing. Now the political economy is uh, not uh, easy because uh, cutting rates uh, you get approval, uh, rising the rate afterwards it's complicated. So then you need to make it automatic and you're back to the initial problem of the trigger. Take maybe another comment and then a round of reactions. Uh, uh, Marcello, I saw you wanted, no, 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 no. So uh, yeah, George, go ahead. I have a fairly simple minded question, which is, are, are we looking at quasi-economic stabilizers to create a continuum between automatic stabilizers and pure discretionary policy? Because automatic stabilizers are exactly that. They're automatic. They have their problems, but they're automatic. Discretionary policy, in the purest sense, is pure discretion. So we're looking at quasi-automatic to bridge the gap. Is that 
to introduce more flexibility into the system, or is it the political economy argument of not wanting to have a pure discretion? If it is the political economy argument, then I, I'll go along, I guess, in, in saying that, yes, perhaps on the expenditure side in terms of unemployment benefits, that's easier to do because you can extend, change, it's very hard to bring them back, but you can certainly extend. And your argument about the the uh, uh, the implications for, for uh, the neutrality for debt, you know, uh, holds. On the tax side, I would be extremely reluctant to to play with VAT rates. Uh, first of all, there's a, there's a pure discretionary aspect there. You decide on VAT rates. Try bringing them back once you have reduced them. It is extremely difficult. And then if people, if you keep doing that, then it will simply become part of pure discretionary policy as well. So I'm I'm trying to understand what our purpose is exactly in introducing this in between step between the automatic the pure automaticity of what we've got and the discretionary policy. Interesting what you said about um, there not being enough work on this. I completely agree with you about economics, but I think that's actually not because people don't think it's important. I think it's just the incentives we have around research and where resources are in economics are all on monetary and not on on fiscal. So I think you know one for lots of uh, for sort of upcoming economists to focus on because there's a lot more space. I think in terms of producing. Um, the a question I had, I think I think this, uh, Eric made the same point is. Does the combination of the sort of maths that you showed us, the direction that shocks come, you know, hit in, in that uh, the the negative basically on average, and also the biases towards um, the sort of political biases in the system, the bias towards debt funded spending, mean that actually you shouldn't be looking for neutrality. You should be looking sort of in peacetime to be tightening and in a sense over tightening. Um, and then there's, I guess, a similar point on this political challenge. I think when economists talk about fiscal policy and automatic stabilizers, they, they basically always reach to try and take away the discretion, which is, of course, just completely understandable. I think your language was potential misuse for the sort of political pressures. But I guess my question was how credible that is and, and does it matter if it's not really, which I think the VAT one is a, a good example and the un unemployment benefits are a, a good example of. I mean, we've done some work on the response to the energy price shock and the fiscal support that people put in, countries put in place. I mean, energy prices in Europe are now back to where they were well before the war, but a lot of that fiscal support for energy prices is still in place mm -hmm. in countries. And, you know, that's just an example of literally yeah. the entire justification has been taken away, but the fiscal support is still there. When you talk about energy prices, are where they were before the crisis, or you're talking about the retail price? Both, basically. Yeah. The wholesale and the retail prices are now basically back. But for consumers, the issue is over, but we're still providing quite a lot of support. Okay. Uh, maybe. Uh, answer many, if not all. If not um, I see these quasi-automatic stabilizers as being most useful for run-of-the-mill fluctuations. I think for exceptional events, COVID or the, uh, or the, the global financial crisis, it's clear that the magnitude and the nature of it is such that discretionary policy has to come in. And you can still have the automatic stabilizers, but that's not... Uh, much more needs to be done. Now, I think the issue in this case is... This is discretionary, right? Uh, fiscal policy, and again, there is the risk that it's overused, and uh, it clearly has been overused. So, I think that the way you handle this is for the fiscal rules, not the automatic stabilizers. Which is, when a government tells you that because of COVID or because of the energy prices they put things in place, you want to see at the end, have you removed everything? And as you say, they haven't. And if you haven't removed them, mm -hmm. is there a good reason? I mean, sometimes we learn something in a crisis which we want to keep, uh, that there is no way around. And basically, when you have exceptional events, you have to have exceptional policy. Exceptional policy means potential biases. Uh, 
and you cannot avoid it. So I think it's a different issue. I think it can be handled for fiscal rules. But again, I, there are limits to what automatic or quasi-automatic stabilizers can do. Uh, the on wall. Um, my sense is, I may be wrong, I may be naive, that we can design uh, debt neutral automatic stabilizers. We can basically have something which says when unemployment goes above some level, the VAT rate will be decreased by X, and then we can decide whether it's contingent on unemployment going down or it's for five years or whatever. Uh, and this will come with a slightly higher VAT rate for the next 10 years. I think once this is I, a question, is, can governments accept that? I have a sense that's not inconceivable. And once it's there, is there room for misuse? I think it's limited, but that might reflect my naivete or my belief in the goodness of the human uh, the human government. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on Eric, I mean, you made a remark which had nothing to do with fiscal, but which I think is really important for another conference, which is, did monetary policy this time work because of its mechanical effect or because of its signaling effect? And with absolutely obvious, you know, based on the work I've done with Ben, uh, Bernanke on the US and then on other countries, that the reason it wasn't so bad, Is was the credibility of the central banks and the fact that long-run expectations didn't move or nearly didn't move. And But once there was that, you have a sense that monetary policy was not, as long as credibility remained, the rest was relatively unimportant. Uh, there was no conceptually there. If you had been able to eliminate, to not increase interest rates and keep the same credibility, the outcome would have been the same, is my sense. Now, the question we don't have the answer to is, if they had not increased interest rates, if there hadn't been this signal, would credibility have stayed? But maybe it was all for sure, for a useful reason. I don't know. But it's you raised it. I think that's going to be a big question in analyzing monetary policy response to, uh, uh, to, to, to what happened uh, in the last two years. Um, Unemployment is lagging viable. So that's a standard belief. But I found, and that was fairly robust, in the work with, again, Danny Kwa, we basically have a response of output and unemployment to a demand shock, and there was basically no lag. So I'm not saying that's the final word, but maybe we should be more skeptical that there is a long lag, and therefore it's better to work with another variable. Um, You raised issues about we're starting to get to the threshold, but we're not there, Eric. Uh, and and the markets start wondering what's going to happen. It's a bit like, you know, will the Fed increase rates in March or May or whatever? Uh, what happens here is that, indeed, as you get closer to the threshold, uh, then the markets are going to anticipate it. Uh, and, and people may anticipate it. And and maybe they are going to basically wait until the the gift is there. So if you know that you know next period the VAT rate will be decreased, but it hasn't been decreased yet, right? And then you create the recession basically by moving it one step. Now, in the end, when you sit down in the mall, what this changes is the timing of a recession. It happens earlier, uh, but not the um, I mean the amplitude is still smaller. So, but there's clearly expectation effects in the same way as will the Fed do that or not? And they come in this way. Uh, on Vito, uh, yes, I think insurance mechanisms is yet another dimension we should explore. I agree with that. Uh, and then the debt shocks <laughs> seem to come from these big episodes, uh, GFC, COVID, where we got has nothing, implication has nothing to do with automatic stabilizers. It says that the goal in thinking about where we want to take the primary balance is not zero. 
uh, it is actually a surplus of 1%, so that if there's a crisis every 10 years, then we have the money. But I think that's more about uh, the non-automatic stabilizers part of the story. Uh, but we should, in this one, you know, one in a hundred years crisis keep coming every 10 years. And I think we have to take this into account. Um, I think I answered banked in directly, which is automatic stabilizers is really not about these big, big events, which I think is the, so if I've not come back, um, and yes, I don't think I disagreed with, I mean, if we're going to use GDP and the issue of revisions in GDP is a really big one, revisions in unemployment are not. So I think that's one more argument. And, uh, on, uh, Yes, the reason why there is much more work on monetary policy than on fiscal policy is seniorage, which is central banks have large research teams and can <laughs> afford it. And the ministries of finance don't have that because they are in the business of reducing spending. Uh, and if you're at, uh, as you know, if you're at the ministry of finance, then you're not given three years to work on something, you work on something for next week. So there is this fundamental uh, asymmetry, but I think we should, as academic, we have no particular incentive to work on one or the other. And I think the marginal benefits of working on fiscal are larger now than on money. Um, and then the question of credibility, which is if there is a rule, is it going to be, you know, stuck to and I my sense again is yes I think if it it, it can be done uh, but I'm not sure uh, there were other questions but apologies for uh yeah George uh no I I, I don't see this as a continuum I mean I see this as doing something quickly which cannot be done through the political process but Yes, if, a, if, if we could reduce the political process and it went really fast, then I think that what the quasi-automatic stabilizer tries to do is what fiscal policy would, discretionary policy would do uh, if it could act quickly, but it cannot. Thanks. You, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Now, the, the first thing I, I need to, to make a further uh, disclaimer, uh, I'm not, repeat, not talking about monetary policy. Bank of Italy officials and European system, central bank officials have other opportunities to, to do that. So um, I'm not reacting to, to what has been said on that. Uh, please do not take silence as consent. I, I think that uh, uh, there are many things that could be said, but I, it's not it's not a place to say them. Uh, having said that, I, I, I do agree with, with um, other things that uh, Mr. Nielsen said, So, uh, and I'll go back to, to, to that in a minute. Uh, a, a few um, comments. Um, several, uh, and several persons, the, including our, our chair, have... Um, mention the, the the really big crisis now uh, there's, there's something that, that, that I think it was made very clear by by Olivier in, in his inter his first intervention we need to distinguish between supply shocks and demand shocks if we are talking about uh, covid that was a, the 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 the, uh, the the most obvious supply shock that you that you can have and although of course they did the, the having uh, support for households for for firms for companies in in this case can has been justified for a number of reasons this is not repeat not a, a stabilizer in the sense of stabilizing demand it's a completely different thing completely different thing and and actually from the point of view of uh, um, excess demand, uh, having support in, in uh, supporting demand when when the supply goes down is is a problem, not a, not a not a solution. A, a small thing about accidental stabilizer stabilizers that's that's been said uh, several times. Uh, I mean, uh, nobody would say that uh, stabilize uh, automatic stabilizers as they exist are optimal in the sense of uh, stabilization, optimal for stabilization. But let's face it that few things in 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 in, in, in um, economic policies that 
can be defined as optimal, especially because they typically serve different uh, purposes. So uh, in, in uh, I, I think that if we, uh, if we would like to design the optimal automatic stabilizers, then we would be perhaps confronted with the need to, to keep to, to take account of the fact that, uh, for instance, uh, income support, um, tax relief, uh, unemployment support, those are all things that are also needed for different reasons than, than economic stabilization. So I, I, don't, I, I think that it would be sterile for us to uh, try to design something that is absolutely 100% optimal from one particular point of view when there are many others. Um, then the pitfalls, and I think that the the the, the discussion has been very very. I, I mentioned very briefly the 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 uh, the existence of conceptual and practical problems with the idea of a semi automatic semi automatic stabilizers, and I think that the various interventions have um, have uh, explained that um, in much more details, and that's when I think that the, the trigger pitfalls that uh, Mr. Nelson mentioned are extremely important in, in, in terms of market reactions, in terms of um, the counterproductive effect when, when people anticipate something that is not already there. And then there is, uh, for instance, Agnès's uh, point about the, the, the fact that when you design um, uh, unemployment benefits, you have also micro problems to take into account. Um, then there is the 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 the, the, the issue that uh, the issue of, of measurement. I and, and, and I said that, but but uh, one specific issue of measurement is revisions, and that's also been mentioned um, several times. And then the issue of the sunset clause. And, and I think it's it's funny that we 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 talked about uh, the uh, big risk of withdrawing uh, benefits too early. I think that realistically, the opposite is is much more likely that uh, that it would be difficult for uh, for a for a um, for a um, theoretically temporary um, temporary um, benefit to be uh, withdrawn when it is necessary to withdraw it. So, so, so the risk of having the, the benefits that are out of phase with the cycle because they 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 cannot they they do not have a an effective sunset clause is, is I think more uh, more important than than the than the than the opposite risk. So my conclusion again, as I said from from the beginning, frankly, in my view, automatic stabilizers are clearly preferable as a as a uh, as an instrument. Semi-automatic discretion in, in, in the stabilizers may be um, needed in certain very very specific exceptional cases, but they they have um, lots of lots of, of problems. Semi-automatic have many pitfalls, but they do exist in 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 in, in, a, in, in at least in a in a few uh, cases, and I think I do think that it is reasonable to explore the the the, the issue further. Uh, and uh, including the, 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 the taking account of the various pitfalls that have been mentioned, um, maybe I, I came out from this discussion a slightly more more skeptical than I went into this this discussion after the, what what I heard. But I do think that uh, exploring is a good thing. The the, the certain ideas are, are clearly very are clearly valuable. So exploring is, is is a good thing. I wouldn't commit to the to the to the um, result of the exploration, but I think that at least the intellectual challenge is, is very is very nice. Thank you. <clears throat> um, uh, thank you. Uh, we are ten minutes over time. Uh, I was wondering whether uh, uh, you still uh, wanted to maybe come in. Uh, so just point. very very quickly, uh, there was a question in the beginning: Has our thinking changed um, after the crisis? And I think uh, certainly with COVID, I think people have come to expect much more from governments. And uh, we've seen also well, in my country, Netherlands, disciplined culture has disappeared. On top of that, there is of course the populist pressures. That you know, keep on you know the pressure on you know, more spending. So I think that is uh, that is one on the you know potential debt crisis, etc. I think what is very important is of course the distribution of the debt ratios. It's not so much the average. Average is important, but it's the distribution. And the more screwed it is, the more dangerous dangerous it is. 
And that's also, it does, it's not only for the risk of a crisis, but it's also important for the fact that, you know, there's an asymmetry in responses that countries can, you know, undertake against uh, crisis. So that is uh, quite important. I think regarding the quasi-automatic stabilizers, I see them basically as an enhancement of the automatic uh, stabilizers. And when it comes to choosing a moment when they should uh, be terminated, it's probably better to make that data dependent. But that also, I think, risk runs creates a risk of not being neutral in terms of that over the over the cycle. Thank you. I didn't plan to say anything, but it, I took it for granted that the exit would also be data dependent, right? I mean, it, it yeah. So it's um, otherwise it wouldn't work. You couldn't. You could never. Your formula wouldn't work, right? If you are. Uh, if uh, if there was a discretionary decision to hike the VAT rates up again, so yeah. Christian, we have to meet some Christian.
Okay, so maybe we can uh, start. Uh, just a very quick uh, thought experiment that is not at all unlikely to happen, uh, impossible to exclude that it will happen. Trump uh, wins uh, the election and he's serious about implementing his uh, trade program. So 10% tariffs on all countries, 60% tariffs on China, and, and Europe has, uh, I think last year, 2.8% uh, current account surplus, which is extraordinary. Very asymmetric impacts, by the way, because two countries in particular have a, a big uh, trade surplus in goods, which is Germany and Italy. So how would uh, Italy react? How would uh, how we would uh, sh we should describe that kind of shock, supply shock, or, or what else? So this is just to say that maybe we are not at the end of the line of the uh, unthinkable shocks for which we need probably European stabilizers. And we have another stellar panel to discuss these issues. And I, I would uh, start with Isabel Van Stenkister from, from the ECB. Thank you very much. I'm I'm the next person who's going to try to uh, <laughs> struggle with uh, remote. Let's see if I manage. Um, and I should also, uh, like others before me, have disclaimer that this is my view and not the view of the ECB, uh, but you may have already guessed that. Um, I was asked to uh, talk here about the question, is there space for a central stabilization tool in the EU? And I mean, I'm not the first person who has been asked this question, and I'm not the first person who has thought about this. Actually, if you look already back in the 70s, when there was discussions about the monetary union, a fiscal union, or at least a central, a federal budget was always part and parcel of, of a package of a complete monetary union, right? So, um, you know, this, this question is kind of an old one, so, but I will try to go a little bit back in time very briefly, um, but then also look a bit at what are the new elements that we've had, what have you learned from the recent period since the pandemic, um, and, you know, what the current context, and actually Federico kind of alluded to it. I mean, we were actually in a bit of a changing world. You know, what does that mean when we think about um, EU fiscal stabilization, right? So, so just going back in time, as I just mentioned, I mean, the EMU was more or less, um, you know, was an incomplete monetary union, right? It was not just a fiscal union that was lacking. There were other elements as well, but it was in the end, it was a, a pragmatic approach, right? I mean, we would not have moved forward most likely with the monetary union if you would have wanted to have a complete monetary union from the outset. And the hope was more or less that uh, convergence would emerge over time so that countries would at least at some point agree to uh, some sort of fiscal stabilization at the central level, um, ideally outside crisis. So far, we have not ne necessarily managed in Europe to make grand steps forward outside crisis. But I mean, hope uh, is the last to die. So we always continue to discuss these issues, even in, in quieter times. Um, and actually, uh, we did make some progress right over the years. Um, as I said, unfortunately, mainly in crisis. Um, if you look, for instance, in the, in the, in the follow-up to the sovereign debt crisis, the SM was set up on the fiscal side. And um, the, the pandemic definitely led to uh, some instruments, which arguably are temporary in nature, but they're, they're very much central. And they can also give us some food for thought about um, how we look at this going forward, right? But of course, um, none of these instruments are permanent in nature. And so the question is first, should we have it? And as I you may already guess, the answer is yes. I mean, uh, I think um, the economic arguments all speak in favor. It's the political arguments that speak against. And the other question is, how should it be designed if we set up one, right? So just going a little bit through um, the literature, and if you look over time, as I mentioned, there was been a lot of discussion about um, fiscal stabilization instruments at the central level. But actually, the, the debate has evolved a bit on time over what type of instrument we could be thinking of. I mean, there was a time and there was a lot of discussion, for instance, of having a European unemployment insurance scheme. Um, there's also quite some papers about fiscal support. I didn't want to talk about transfer here because that re triggers re um, allergic reactions in some corners in Europe. Right, but I mean, these papers take an ideal world scenario, no, uh, no constraints even from treaties sometimes, and just say what would be the ideal setup and think of designing a central fiscal capacity. Right, and 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 these kind of top line um, ideas were really like focused on fiscal stabilization. Now, if you look in the more recent period, the debate has shifted a little bit, and it has been more about European public goods uh, nature, need for investment, right, and then. 
via the back door, let's say, we kind of hope that or we think that this may also offer fiscal stabilization for adverse shocks, right? So we, we haven't abandoned that idea, but we're trying to put it in another context, partly because the debate has evolved, right? We have a discussion about more needs for public investment, especially with the climate digital transition. More recently, now we also have a discussion on defense, right? And I mean, the EU leaders uh, met this week in Brussels and that was a big topic on the agenda, right? And this is like the ultimate public good, right? So if you would think about this, uh, you would want to design this at the European level, ideally. And of course, the other discussion that, that um, you know, kind of led to this debate is, of course, that we have seen if uh, there are fiscal austerity measures, the first one to suffer tends to be investment, right? And I mean, that really deteriorates the quality of your um, fiscal spending. So you also want to have at least incentives and a setup that allows that you have sufficient investment. And, and in Europe, that debate is, is very prominent also because if you look at the competitiveness issue and there the comparison with the US, for instance, also comes back into play. Right. So, so there has been a lot of discussion about setting up a fiscal stabilization instrument at the central level. There has been a bit of an evolution over time. As I said, these are a lot of pa papers in the academic world, which, you know, uh, think about what would be ideally achieved. I mean, but can we also get there, right? Because as I mentioned, the, the constraints are more political in nature. And I think um, starting with the positive side, I mean, I would say if you look at... A, you know, the, the pandemic brought a lot of bad things, right? That's undeniable. But what it did show is that in case of very large shocks, Europe can get together, right? So if there's a large common shock, um, you know, it, it took quite some time and, and some all-nighters of discussion, but uh, facilities were set up. And of course, the most prominent one when we're thinking about um, kind of a fiscal uh, stabilization tool at the central level, then we were thinking about the recovery and, and, and resilience facility, right? And you can see here, this is just a slide with some, uh, figures um, to give you an idea. I mean, you know, it, it was quite substantial. So the RRF alone was, you know, slightly north of 700 billion in total, 50-50 between loans and grants. And it was the first large-scale project at the EU level that was an incentive-based, right? So, um, you know, if countries were complying with certain milestones targets, then they can expect disbursements to come and payments to come from, from this instrument, right? And so, so that's also a very different mindset of thinking in, in Europe compared to the fiscal rules that were more corrective and penalty based that we, we moved towards an incentive based setup. Uh, what you also see in terms of the setup is that the objectives were really also already going towards these needs that we have in Europe for the climate and digital transition, right? And the last point just in the, the bottom right corner of the slide, what you can see is that we're more or less halfway now. Yeah. Um, so expecting a midterm evaluation report um, you know, it has, it has come basically, and uh, you know, the end of the road should come in 2026. And actually, the Commission has committed to an ex post evaluation by, by 2028. So, in some ways, it's maybe too early to do a full evaluation, but um, just having the next slide here, um, in the next two slides, some kind of track record or where do we stand with this RRF? Because it's important to understand this to say, you know, is there scope to, to think about this in a more permanent basis, right? Um, was this a good experience that we had in Europe or should we think of something totally different, right? And so first metric um, is of course, to what extent have, and in fact, these fund, funds been disbursed, have countries met milestones and targets? And what you can see here is um, compared to what was more or less the target set um, by the fourth quarter of 2023, we were, I would say, broadly on track, right? So, so there was quite a bit of catch up in, in the fourth quarter of 2023. Um, but if you look now, um, you know, 42.9% of the funds have been disbursed, right? That's 10% more or less behind what was the target, right? Um, around 50% have been requested. Um, so compared to the kind of schedule that we have, um, the RRF is, is, is broadly on track. But of course, the disbursement alone is not a good metric of, of whether this is a successful scheme uh, by itself. So we need to also look at a few other um, points, right? And so one is a discussion that has been taking place on the efficiency, right? And here, um, there's of course a trade-off between um, having sound governance, right? You want this money not to be spent wastefully and administrative burden, right? Um, and of course, um, I would say one thing on the RRF is that, of course, there's a high fixed cost in setting this up, right? So to get um, countries to uh, administratively understand what needs to be submitted, I think for the commission, I leave it more to Martin to confirm that there must have also been a fixed cost in setting this up. And there were all the committees in Brussels that uh, across member states needed to go through these, these plans and proposals. I mean, there is a high 
fixed cost. But of course, once this is set up, um, you know, then of course the the marginal cost, let's say, is is much lower, right? And uh, I just want you to keep that in mind when I will talk about the more permanency of of the instrument as well. Now, on the positive side is also that there are currently ongoing reflections about simplifying because there were discussions that, that things were sometimes too administrative burdensome. So there's a lot of learning going on in, in, in this process. Right? The second question is about relevance, right? So to what extent is, is, is the RRF hitting the target? And I think one thing to point is that actually it's also been a quite flexible instrument, right? So with the energy crisis, you've seen kind of... Uh, the repower EU being introduced. And so there was a bit of shift in focus of the RRF, which is also a positive if, if, if you want to have an effective tool. And then the third question is, is the effectiveness itself in terms of the economic impact? And of course, it's difficult to assess because reforms take time, investment takes time to, to show its effect. And on top of that, we've had actually a bit of a backloading on the capital intensive investment. So if you look at evaluation by the commission, you know, the impact was maybe lesser than we had thought initially, but that's mainly because the investment, the capital intensive investment came later. So, so we may still see the full effects um, later in time. But there's also been a discussion about cost effectiveness, right? So compared to how much these EU bonds cost when, you know, when the scheme was set up and, and, and what they cost, I mean, there, there has been a change, right? So, so you would have thought this is, you know, um, highly safe, bonds, right? So there's no real credit risk. So you would expect they're trading like a AAA government bond, but actually they're trading like agency bonds, right? So they're trading like an ESM bond. That's not because of the credit risk, but that's because of the liquidity issue, right? And, and, and there I want to come back to the EU value added question, because some would use this as an argument to say this instrument didn't make sense as an EU level, because, you know, it's, it, it, it hasn't brought the cost savings that we had thought. But actually, the reason why you have this liquidity premium, in my view, is that it's not a permanent instrument, right? So, so, yeah, okay, Eric is confirming he's in the market, but in the market, they like regular issuance, they like to have an, a, a calendar, and this instrument is basically, it has an end date to it, and that makes it far less appealing. So, I would argue the opposite to those who say it's not being cost effective, let's forget about it, it's more the argument, let's, relax, let's make it permanent. And the other point is on the efficiency is another argument to say, let's make this permanent because you have a high administrative cost to set it up. I mean, it's really a pity now that this is working and this is running well to abandon this already in, in the final quarter of 2026, right? So, so I think, you know, the kind of evaluation of the RF at midterm, it's maybe too early in some ways, but I think there's a lot of things that are going on there that would actually argue to make this instrument more permanent. Now, of course, politically, I, I leave that aside, it's a more difficult discussion, right? So there, there are some allergic reactions as soon as you start saying permanent instruments, stabilization, uh, these words uh, are, are in some corners in Europe not always so popular. But if you, we park these ideas a bit aside and we say, is it actually economically a good idea also for those who are not so much in favor of a central fiscal capacity, right? And does it also bring them economic benefits? And and here I want to just um, promote some work uh, that some that's a team in my department has been doing, where they say, okay, if we would set up a central fiscal capacity, let's think about what elements it should have, and then let's analyze what kind of benefits this brings, right? So so the elements that it should have is first of all it should offer macro stabilization, right? So it should deal with you know either common shocks that have asymmetric effects, or it should be able to. Uh, to deal with uh, stabilization to question the asymmetric shocks across member states. We want at the same time, of course, that it promotes compliance with the fiscal rules, right? So we don't want it to create perverse incentives at the national level. And the third question point is that we want it to um, make sure that the quality of, of public spending is good, right? So, so we want to have an, 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 a setup that supports that public investment mitigates the pro-cyclicality, right? And so they, they set up a two country DSGE model where you have a high debt group of countries, low debt, right? And so they calibrated it to the euro area. And they basically analyzed what is the impact if you set up such a permanent central fiscal capacity, right? For GDP volatility in both the high debt and low debt uh, countries. And so what you see is that the impact is of course more positive for the high debt region, but also the low debt region benefits. So at least economically, you know, there is no argument that speaks against it, right? So this is back to my point that it's, you know, with economics, we should be able to convince them it's more an issue of, of politics, right? So then I come to my last slide, which is let's go more to, you know, the political 
reality, you know, what, what could be more palatable alternatives. And here we did also some work looking at setups that could be more politically um, feasible because they, they stick to the treaty constraints, right? Or they, they deal with issues that are commonly understood at European level. And so one option is, for instance, the Climate and Energy Security Fund. Um, so the idea is here actually to draw on the same legal basis as um, the RRF has been set up. So this is the article 122.2 for those uh, who are treaty experts of the treaty. So this is to deal with crisis situations. So you could say, you know, we have an energy security crisis or a climate crisis, right? And so that would justify setting up a fund for these reasons, right? And so, you know, this kind of fund would be very similar to setting up an NGU in terms of nature and structure, only the motivation is different. It would not be the pandemic related, but it would be related more to climate energy security issues. I mean, you can think of the defense debate in, in a similar kind of context. So that would be one option. I mean, it has a drawback, of course, it still has this temporality element, right? So you come again with the liquidity premium on the bond. So, so, so that remains a question mark. The other option would be to say, okay, we have this discussion on European public goods, right, which are, you know, would be a natural candidate to set up at the EU level because, you know, that's kind of the, the public good aspect of it. It's, it should be in all our common interest. So let's set up a central fiscal capacity that focuses on European public goods. So this is looking at to what extent can we then get fiscal stabilization, let's say, through the back door, right? Um, and here with the same uh, two-country DSGE model that um, my team had set up, they find actually that it does also offer some de facto stabilization. Lesser than, of course, if you set up a tool that has immediately that as an objective, but it would still be um, offering that benefits. And what they also find is that if you set it, if the funding goes through common bond issuance, actually the, the stabilization effect is, is larger. So, you know, these are kind of the two al like alternatives to the ideal world scenario. I'm still not saying that they're politically fully feasible, but I think it's definitely worth considering to go into these directions. I mean, either you go for another temporary fund that looks at, you know, the, the current emergencies. And unfortunately we have, we are like in a poly crisis environment. So, um, you know, there, there are some motivations to, to set up a, a new type of fund, or we go to the European public goods uh, focused central fiscal capacity, which does seem to offer also some de facto stabilization. And this is, where I finished my presentation, just taking some stock, right? So EMU fiscal governance, you know, I think unfortunately remains incomplete. Ideally we had a fiscal central fiscal capacity. So such a capacity should normally offer stabilization to cushion for shocks, foster compliance with the EU fiscal framework and support public investment. Just as a side remark here, I think actually a central fiscal capacity currently after the new fiscal rules is even more justified because there is unfortunately no consideration for the euro area fiscal stance, right? And so that consideration got forgotten in the lengthy discussions that took place on designing national fiscal rules, right? So, you know, having a central fiscal capacity would even be in the current environment a better complement to, to the national fiscal rules than that we had already in the debate before. Now, of course, as I said, politically, this may be very difficult. At the same time, we see also some common European challenges that may provide motivation today to set up an instrument at the central level, be it temporarily based on the crisis motivation, right? So you continue the, the narrative of the NGU, or you go towards the European public goods focused central fiscal capacity, which may be also in the current discussion on defense could have a uh, potential. And actually what we do find is that this offers some de facto stabilization, right? While it has this added benefit that some common investment needs would be met. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Isabel. Um, this begs the question uh, of uh, uh, what institutions institutions are going to manage the next, let's call it uh, the next NGU. Uh, may maybe some there is a matter of quality of the programs and whether we want to have I don't know maybe the EIB involved in some of the programming or execution. But uh, we will come to that maybe later. Uh, now we have uh, Vitor Gaspar from the IMF. You have the floor. Uh, thank you so much. I do have uh, slides as well. I um, want, in a sense, to look at Europe from the outside. As uh, uh, some of you may know, 
I work for the International Monetary Fund uh, in Washington. So I have the benefit of distance. And so, so this to go forward. This is my perfect. I uh, I'm I'm now being tested the hard way. So I think that my benefit, my comparative advantage in this group is uh, distance. So I will give you a view from afar. It turns out that I'm in the embarrassing uh, position of raising some issues that Isabel has already tackled. But that allows me to be short, which uh, Federico is not going to complain about, I believe. So I want, in a sense, to look at some important trends uh, of the European Union in the world. Then I want, in a sense, to go full blast arguing that uh, central fiscal capacity is something that would benefit fiscal governance in the European Union. That turns out to be uh, official IMF uh, position, and then I uh, will look at the next generation EU and what can we uh, learn from that experience. So when you look at uh, the Euro area and you compare with the world and the US, this is basically the trend in five year ahead growth forecasts. You see that growth in the Euro area is low compared with the US and uh, the world, and it's trending, it is trending uh, down. In my favorite version of this chart, that apparently is not the one that I brought here, instead of the world, you have China. And the uh, forecasts for China five years ahead are trending down as well, but you have a level which is substantially above that of the world. So it's a version of this chart, but it's more spectacular. Okay. Now, if one looks at uh, Europe in, the, uh, in terms of weight compared with other uh, big blocks, you see that Europe is significantly smaller than the US. You have that on the left-hand side. And that recently, Europe has come below China. I'm not using uh, PPPs here. I'm using uh, current exchange rates. So it's, it's actually uh, quite remarkable, the uh, trend in Europe. And I've, uh, I've used this uh, slide uh, very recently in uh, Frankfurt at the ECB Watchers Conference. And what people remembered from my presentation is that uh, Europe is uh, getting smaller in the world. That was the only thing that people remembered of uh, what I had to say. Uh, what you see on the uh, right-hand side is that the euro as a denominator of uh, um, issuance of corporate bonds in the world is uh, uh, going down as well. And when I'm more complete, I have a third chart in which uh, one sees the size of the banking sector by assets. And of course, there the euro area is bigger than the US because it is a bank-based system. But the rise of China has been uh, quite fast, and China is now well uh, ahead of uh, the euro area in the size of the banking system. Now, I hope that this chart will shock you. Perhaps it won't, but it may. So what you see here is that in 2022, the US and the Euro area had basically the same level of cyclically adjusted primary deficit than the US uh, more or less, well, actually more than doubled the cyclically adjusted primary balance while uh, Europe uh, trended uh, down gradually 
Europe is approaching a balance in terms of the primary balance five years ahead, the, dis the difference between the primary balance and the cyclically adjusted uh, primary balance vanishes, while the US continues to have a uh, high uh, primary deficit. And you would see uh, a more spectacular trend if you would be looking at the overall balance, because interest rates have gone up and the public debt ratio uh, also goes up. You have that on the right-hand side, where uh, the uh, comparison is between the uh, path which was projected before the pandemic. You have that in a uh, faint dashed blue for the euro area, fainted uh, dashed purple for the United States. And so what you see is that now for the United States, we have much higher debt and we have debt projected to increase faster than pre-pandemic. Well, for the euro area, it is also higher and it's projected to decline uh, slower than pre-pandemic, okay? But in any case, there is quite a substantial uh, divergence in uh, uh, budget positions between the US and uh, Europe. The case for uh, a central fiscal capacity, you have heard that from Isabel, uh, we can justify a central fiscal capacity based on EU-wide public goods. We can uh, make a case based on uh, macroeconomic uh, stability and in particular macroeconomic stability at the effective lower bound. That is something that Isabel herself contributed to in an occasional paper that the ECB published at the time of the monetary policy strategy uh, review and is pressure on national budget, which is something that Isabel also spoke about. Now, if we look at the pillars from uh, uh, next generation EU, we see green transition, digital uh, uh, transformation, uh, smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth, social and territorial cohesion, health, and some residual. So this is basically in line with uh, things that you can interpret as uh, EU-wide public goods, especially the green transition and the digital transformation, as Isabel uh, emphasized. And of course, defense, which is the ultimate example of the public good in textbooks, is something that has started being uh, discussed uh, recently. Of course, you can, if you have uh, a focus on investment programs, you can accelerate the execution of uh, investment programs if that is necessary in the context of uh, stabilization against uh, large and persistent uh, demand disturbances. They have to be large and persistent. If they're not large and persistent, you're likely to get it wrong. Now, this story is uh, just to explain how things can work differently at the effective lower bound. In uh, normal circumstances, if you have a demand, uh, a negative demand shock, you have inflation follow, falling, and uh, the central bank can lower uh, interest rates. That with well-anchored uh, inflation expectations leads to lower real interest rates, real depreciation, higher nominal GDP, the business cycle is being stabilized. If you're at the effective lower bound, it doesn't work that way. You have a negative demand shock, inflation goes down, but you cannot change interest rates. So mechanically, uh, it may happen, and we have examples that it empirically has happened that inflation expectations drift down, which leads to higher uh, real interest rates with some reasonable terminal uh, conditions that we use in uh, macroeconomic models. You actually have uh, a, a real appreciation of the currency that leads to a lower uh, nominal GDP. And so uh, real interest rates, real exchange rates and expectations instead of helping stabilization actually amplify the uh, initial shock. How can this be short circuit? Of course, the central bank can use unconventional tools, 
but what we know about the transmission mechanism of unconventional tools is even less than we know about the transmission mechanism of uh, uh, monetary policy through interest rates. And so having a fiscal support helps a lot. And I believe this is a reasonable interpretation of what uh, Isabel, Klaus Musuch, and others have, uh, have, uh, have pushed for. Now, Isabel also made this point that uh, given the diversity of fiscal positions in the union, we have on the left-hand side uh, debt and deficits uh, in uh, the union. You have a more visible distribution of public debt ratios on the right-hand side to make it simpler. And uh, the fact that there is a central fiscal capacity may help uh, alleviate the pressure on uh, national uh, budgets may help uh, national fiscal policy cope with national idiosyncratic shocks, so it looks like a good idea. What about next generation EU? Now, uh, the issue of the size of the program is something that Isabel has already spoken about, so I will not waste your time with that. I think that this is a reasonably uh, beautiful chart. I'm obviously referring to the quality of the colors that were chosen by my magnificent research analysts. Now, seriously, if you look at the left-hand side of this chart, you see the disturbance uh, during the spring of uh, 2020 with the pandemic when we didn't know what kind of shock and adjustment we were facing. Uh, at that point in time, spreads really skyrocketed. Um, so at the time of the decision to go ahead with the um, recovery and resilience facility, uh, the spreads were already uh, narrowing. Uh, there are numbers of ups and downs uh, there, but by and large uh, spreads have, uh, have come down, which does suggest that the fact that there was a uh, European support mechanism actually had uh, benign uh, effects. Uh, there is an interesting uh, correlation between the support from the RRF and the uh, situation of member states in terms of the quantity of their uh, public uh, capital stock. That's what you have on the uh, right-hand side of the slide. The material on the left-hand side, Isabel, has covered better than uh, I could. I actually would suggest that, Isabel, you may want to consider using this slide on your own presentation because it fits well. You spoke about the conditionality in the design of national programs. Actually, here, what you do see is the, um, the uh, relation between the uh, loans and the ambition of uh, reform programs. And I think that that fits your argument actually quite nicely. Here is again something that Isabel, you have said. E and so are EU bonds a missed opportunity? What you do see, so uh, I, I put there EU bonds uh, in terms of spreads in bold so that you can see it is the dark and wide line, and you see that the conditions of financing of uh, EU bonds at the beginning were actually quite favorable. They were at the bottom of the distribution of spreads. There was a positive spread relative uh, to Germany, but if you take out Germany, it was very, very close to the bottom of the distribution across member states. But that situation deteriorated quite a bit, and at the end, uh, you do have uh, examples of uh, uh, yield spreads above the EU, but not many, which reflects what Isabel said. It doesn't seem that EU bonds are uh, trading in AAA territory. They're trading more like agency bonds. And that is something that one does not attribute to credit risk, but to liquidity risk. But if it is liquidity risk, 
is a, a problem of uh, uh, not proper design, and that's why I call it a missed opportunity. And this is basically what I want to tell you, but let me just make another point. One uh, idea that I want you to think about is that at this point in time, it is too early to evaluate the results of the Recovery Resilience Fund. And it's crucial to have that evaluation done quite systematically exposed. I believe that that exercise is crucial for Europe. The presentation that I made was deliberately optimistic. I was assuming that policies would deliver as designed. That is a strong assumption. One has, in a sense, to go and see and evaluate. One aspect, and you will forgive me, Isabel, where I was worried uh, when uh, you were speaking is that you said, we are still learning, and I believe you added, we are learning a lot. Now, I'm an old man, so I was already listening to music in the 1960s, and therefore I know the Beatles very well. And in the song, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, there is a line that says, with every mistake, we must surely be learning. Now, if the lyrics of While My Guitar uh, Gently Weeps were written by a committee that I would be contributing to, I would be suggesting to the committee very strongly, you should change that line to with all these mistakes, we must surely be learning. <laughs> and that's how I heard you, Isabel. Thank you. I like this because uh, you uh, put it in a such uh, lyrical way compared to the two words that I was thinking about when you were talking, which is, which are more hazard, something that we kept hearing uh, during the great financial crisis, and we haven't uh, heard uh, them mention the two words uh, um, today, but maybe uh, Martin Verbey will want to talk about this, because uh, let me be a little bit more precise in 10 seconds. Uh, when we talk about reforms, and then we see a number of reforms, uh, my question is always about whether we are ticking boxes or we are really changing the institutions there and how you make, I mean, how you know the difference. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't share any slides and we also didn't talk, but you did get right what i was going to, what i'm going to talk about but 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 the uh, before before going there first first compliments to uh vito and uh, isabel for 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 excellent excellent presentations uh and and they make a very strong case obviously for 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 a uh, a central fiscal capacity now I heard the introduction of Marco in the beginning, and Marco said, "Look, the um, the purpose of this this uh, gathering is to bring together different perspectives." And I guess what that means, then, uh, Marco, that you rely on the Commission in in a way to argue yeah. against a, a central fiscal capacity, which which is quite quite ironic uh, in a, in a, in a, in a way. Um, <laughs> Having having said that, and like like others, I, I I need to be clear. What I'm saying is not representing necessarily the view of the Commission. And quite frankly, given the task that I'm giving, I'm not even sure that I'm representing myself in what I'm going to uh, going to say. But but I'll I'll, I'll try to 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 make a, comp a contribution to 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 the discussion. So and and where I I, I want to start is uh, basically and and it's something that uh, both said um, and and in particular Isabel uh, underlined it very very strongly so that that uh, there is a, there is a, I think in this group probably also if if I ask to raise hands who is in favor of a central fiscal capacity then then probably a vast majority of people would uh, economists would would uh, would say well, okay, we can do. 
Who is in favor now of a central fiscal capacity? Okay, so that's that's uh, okay. It's 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 uh, well, a vast majority was was a good prediction, and I think a little bit a little bit more than uh, than that. And then the question is if. So many economists agree on 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 this. Why is it not happening now? Isabel said, "Look, this is it's it's political sensitive, uh, and that that is obviously the case. Uh, but I think it would be useful to to go one level deeper and and ask yourself the question: Okay, but why why is it actually so so politically sensitive?" I uh, discussed it very briefly with Vito over the cup of coffee, uh, coffee, and he said one one sentence: "It's about power." And which which is obviously obviously true at the basis. I think if if we go uh, back in history of of the EMU, a decision was taken uh, to 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 introduce a common common currency uh, at a time. I, I think economists would recommend you you would need to have a political union accompanying that. That was not feasible. And uh, because member states did not want to 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 hand over the, that power, so so since the beginning, we're we're essentially in in a hybrid in a hybrid system where we have common currency, but but national uh, national fiscal fiscal policy. Now that being the case, then uh, thinking about uh, if if you think about fiscal uh, or, or central fiscal capacity in in such a hybrid uh, hybrid situation, you cannot escape the question of uh, of, of moral hazard. Actually, and and uh, it is an uh, it would be an insurance uh, essentially an insurance mechanism, which has many benefits. Uh, but as with any insurance, there is a, there is a there is a risk of uh, of more moral hazard, and uh, so that's that's one point. And and uh, it's important to realize that that uh, member states came from very different uh, positions to to this uh, this common common project uh, to 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 begin with. Uh, and, and certainly in, in, in the group of member states, and I just happened to come from one of those member states, this fear for moral hazard was and still is, I think, very, a very important one. Uh, the other the other thing is that that uh, member states came also from a very had a very different pre pre euro experience. So, so there is a group of, uh, of uh, well, there's Germany, obviously, and, and a group of, of, of countries, uh, smaller countries uh, around Germany, which, which were very uh, much integrated. They had no difficulties in, in a way, giving up uh, domestic stabilization tools. They, they, they... And then there's another group of countries, which, <laughs> some of which bigger uh, and uh, and and, uh, and and certainly at the time and still I think less integrated with uh, with Germany where we're missing a stabilization tool is felt very differently and I I think uh, the, the key points to retain from from that I think that there is or there can be a trade-off between uh, a central fiscal uh, capacity which would be important for stabilization, but on the other hand, the risk of uh, of moral hazard. Um, the secondly, that the trade off, uh, this trade off differs per member state, and the thirdly, that it also differs in time. <laughs> so, so where 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 you are on that on that trade off differs can can differ uh, differ in time, and I think. Um, it's not to say that one cannot find find ways around it, but but I think rather than just say, uh, saying look, uh, it's just political and 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 there is no uh, no issue and they just don't understand economics. I, I think it's important if we want to want to get ahead uh, to realize and to internalize this this in our in our thinking. Um, now and then the second question. So if if politically it's so hard, can can we do do without? Now there there um, I think uh, I think Marco in the beginning alluded to it already, and I would echo that. Uh, I think optimistically we some at least started with with the conviction. Yeah, we can do do uh, without uh, completely with the central fiscal capacity. I think the the, the views on that uh, changed uh, during during the global or to, uh, during the euro crisis where 
even if you believe that that uh, you can have a lot of fiscal stabilization primarily on the uh, on the member states level if uh, if you lose access to 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 finance then there's no possibility to execute that and and what made matters worse i think is 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 that it created in in the a sort of competitive austerity member states even including my own member state the just even though they had AAA credit rating, they wanted to show to the rest of the world we're very different, and also started to cut expenditures in the middle of uh, middle of the crisis. So, clearly, in 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 terms of stabilization, uh, very very suboptimal, and that 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 is an understatement. Now, creation of ESM, and and also I think uh, the the more active or different. Policies of the ECB, I think they 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 clearly improved uh, the situation. Now, here yeah, I think with the ESM was for the first time that we try to internalize in a way this trade-off between stabilization and moral hazard, which which was reflected in the conditions. Uh, but but I think in retrospect, this has been reflected in the conditions in such a way uh, that the bar to use ESM. Is 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 so high that uh, that it's maybe good to contain moral hazard, but but doesn't seem to be working very well when it comes to 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 stabilization. Um, by contrast, I think uh, in, in the more active policies of the ECB clearly have helped uh, to keep markets open in, ter in terms of stress, uh, but that comes with with essentially no uh, no conditionality so so where uh, with all the risk of of uh, of the moral hazard and 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 more important or also important i think an overburdening of of the ecb mandate so so i think it has improved the situation but to say that this is the the end the end game i think is 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 also uh, would not be right. Then, indeed, we have the, had then the, the temporary instruments uh, in reaction to to um, to COVID. Sure, an RF, and here again, I think RF. Again, here we we have tried uh, to internalize this 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 trade off, but but I think uh, between uh, uh, on the one hand more hazard, and on the other hand. Uh, stabilization. I think probably we succeeded better in uh, this, this 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 time around. In uh, um, no, I, I I fully agree. The jury is still out where 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 we are exactly. But but I think uh, certainly it has helped to, to stabilize the situation. So so that that is I think uh, clear. And and uh, now for the time being, I'm optimistic that that we. Also get uh, a fair amount of of of, of reforms, uh, etc. But indeed, it is temporary, and and uh, and here, uh, Isabel and, and Vito have pointed out all the all the limitations of uh, of, of that, uh, and it's it's very hard to 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 argue with uh, with that. So. Having said all this, just, and then I'm, I'm going to conclude with with a few few points. Um, despite all the all the the very good good arguments that are there, I think still politically, I would well never say never, but uh, but I would be surprised to see a move quickly from from here to to a really permanent fis fiscal capacity, uh, and I think. The appetite for that, the political appetite for that, seems uh, seems low. Now, the prospects for new temporary facilities, I think, are probably higher. Uh, but there's one one very, yeah, not so nice thing about it that whether the the prospects for 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 this relate very much with with the state of the world. And uh, and I I see it only happening if if actually the state of the world is really not what we wanted to wanted to be and and that that is and that is immediately also the drawback of of the the, the temporary instruments that you only get to that if 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 the world around you is already pretty scary. Uh, and which with all the the inefficiencies that that brings to and I'm uh, here discounting the. Uh, 
the overwork for commission staff, which which comes to, <laughs> comes to it uh, as well. But but um, now um, I also think that it is probably and and you, you see the narrative change. And I I think even though for economists this is a very important point, but I think politically the need for stabilization it doesn't sell at all. There is no no one is going to to to. I, I'm sorry to say this in in a group of economists, but I don't think that the public that is skeptical about new uh, creating instruments will not be convinced because they say, look, but it's better for macroeconomic stabilization. Uh, I, that's they may be convinced if they say, look, we have a a common challenge. Uh, what I find also very important, a very important thing for, and I'm not saying that that will convince the public, but what I will will miss if the IRF is gone very much is a tool to for for economic policy coordination, uh, because it, it is for once we have something that is able to align the EU interest with the national interest and and if we 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 miss that then then uh, i think we 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 really are going to miss something but but i think the long and the short i i would see stabilization really as a byproduct a very positive byproduct but 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 not not as the the selling uh, argument uh, last maybe two point uh if we're going to create new temporary in instrument i would plead very much to to do that on on platforms that that already exist and and i'm so we have in the past uh, for, for 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 various reasons we we have created uh, special vehicles etc uh, i i think we should uh, should try to avoid that uh, and and that has also to to do with the importance of common issuance so if there is a a new instrument. Let 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 let's use the the EU platform for that. That allows you at least to to continue to issue the same same type of bonds and and uh, and and that that helps in uh, reducing these inefficiencies. Uh, and the last the very last point that I would make here is that not having a fiscal capacity. Uh, doesn't mean that there is no moral hazard, and it's something that is often uh, often forgotten. Because if things get bad and there is no fiscal capacity, then uh, the pressure will be on the ECB, and uh, and 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 so so left or right, you're facing. You have to face this this uh, this issue. So let me stop here. Thank. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, much is on the table. Uh, we have seen uh, your charts. Uh, and um, I would say uh, there must be certainly comments and questions. I see uh, the two previous discussions. And, and Marcello, do you mind if I start from him? Because you discussed uh, just before. Go ahead. And then... <laughs> Thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, your presentations uh, and the discussion. And uh, in this perspective, I would uh, like to raise a number of different questions. That, but let me focus uh, just on two points. Uh, the first uh, relates to the relationship between uh, a possible permanent fiscal central fiscal capacity and uh, stabilization. My question is, is it appropriate uh, to assess uh, the impact uh, of a central fiscal capacity just referring to stabilization? It seems to me that uh, from this point of view, the tool of central fiscal capacity could be dominated uh, by other policy tools. Uh, the point is that uh, central fiscal capacity also aims at, uh, for instance, improving uh, convergence within the area and uh, to uh, improve uh, uh, the integration uh, frontier of European Union. Uh, my second question uh, relates to the possibility to have uh, a full overlapping between uh, a central fiscal capacity and uh, a recovery and resilience facility. Um, 
I should uh, disagree on uh, this identification in the sense that, uh, uh, as you told us, uh, central fiscal capacity requires uh, not just uh, a centralized uh, uh, financing, but also a centralized production. And uh, from this point of view, a component uh, of a permanent uh, fiscal capacity uh, would be uh, uh, public goods. Uh, uh, as you know, recovering resilience facility uh, is uh, inappropriate from this point of view due to the fact that uh, production reforms, investment uh, and production as uh, uh, are stated at the national levels. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I was going to make a point that is quite related. And I mean, we are talking about stabilization. So central fiscal capacity can, of course, be used for stabilization. But I want to emphasize that it has also other purposes. And thinking of European public goods, typically the type of goods that would not be internalized enough by individual countries to invest in, because it, it might be too big, the spillovers accrue to other countries. I'm typically thinking of, for example, electricity grids, where, by the way, I mean, so all the countries need to invest in those. And by the way, it's not only, you know, the level of investment, et cetera, but also probably lack of coordination and, and that. Uh, also, defense, which is also a public good with spillovers, transnational, uh, you know, high-speed railways, uh, hydrogen infrastructure, that would be an enormous investment. So I think, you know, in terms of, okay, uh, you know, what is the, maybe the most important role of a central fiscal capacity might actually be to provide these European public goods. Thank you. Thanks. I I actually have, a, I wrote a whole lot down, but I have, I'm trying to summarize in two things. The first on, on Marcin, the, your so the issue of the of fiscal capacity, uh, I think, so the good news, I think, is that the debate has changed from being one of, we had a long time ago, it's like to be blue bonds and so on, all these sort of different bonds where nobody really knew what the money was going to be spent on apart from some sort of solidarity thing. Now, the debate is very clear that there's a common need, defense, climate change, on these sort of things. So I think that is a, 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 a very important one. And, and, uh, I think when it comes to moral hazard, I mean, I think the, nobody, I presumably would suggest you have a common fiscal capacity without a matching democratic underwriting. I mean, you can't really tax and 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 spend without that sort of to it. So, so I think that has to be come with it. Which leads me then to this question: where, as economists, at least for myself, I'm thinking about the need for fiscal capacity to match the the currency union, but that's not the EU. And you talked about existing platforms, and I, so how do one square this? Right? I mean, we have a, a pretty broad group of countries, but it's the inner circle that really needs it in a sense, um, which I think is a, a very important one. On, um, on the, I just want to uh, second what Isabel said originally on the on the spread from the market's point of view. There's absolutely no doubt that the reason why the Europe EU bonds trade as they do is, uh, are the two things that it's it's liquidity. And it is the, the temporary nature. I mean, in the market, we talk about the Japanese pension fund problem. You talk to a Japanese pension fund and say, where am I, what box am I, or store am I putting these bonds in? They don't know what they are. And this is this is how they are, in a sense, are, are being treated, which is, is, is a shame. And finally, on this issue, we haven't talked about it. A, a common fiscal capacity that would issue debt for these things would also generate a common risk-free asset, which is hugely important. I mean, it's a, I, I, when you think about the the eurozone having no common fisc, no common um, uh, risk-free asset, which is, is is really distortive, right? Not good. And then the second point, which I I have to say, your charts were fantastic, and a lot has happened at the IMF since I was there 30, 35 years ago. So, so congratulations on, on the, the new color coding and all that sort of stuff. It, it's amazing. I mean, they're amazing. I mean, something has happened at that institution that I have passed me by. I'm completely, yeah. but, but I want to, to, since, since I was looking at George when, when, uh, when you came up, can, can you not also introduce a, a, a less rigid or, or, or reference to debt to GDP? 
I mean, like you saw all these charts, and the first thing I see is Greece, like whoop, all the way, and then it's like kind of thing. I mean, we learn in first year in high school, not even college, that you should be careful mixing debts and uh, stocks and flows, right? And here's your perfect example. You had a debt restructuring and the debt, what I would call the debt service burden of Greece, has nothing to do with this chart, right? Because it's all pushed out there or interest rates are low and all the rest of it. So it's a, so, so it's incredibly important. I mean, you, you hear it all the time, credit rating agencies and all the rest of it. Uh, I would argue, you can, there's not one single measure, but I would certainly argue that interest obligations as a share of GDP or fiscal revenues, and we could discuss, would be a much better measure of sort of the burden of, of debt when you sort of start to compare them. I think that's, I think I'll leave you with this. Thanks. Actually, both the Commission and the IMF have argued for a long time using debt obligations of percent GDP as, as a better measure alongside. Do the markets buy it is, is the other question. Okay, so <clears throat> I have a comment and three questions. Uh, the comment is, I'm wondering whether Given the you know the agreements amongst economists in general that you know central fiscal capacity is a good idea, um, I'm wondering whether politically speaking it is a good idea to talk about a stabilization tool and a longer term convergence competitiveness EPG tool in the same debate because it seems to me that the latter has much less resistance than the former. Stabilization tool is a much harder thing because of the so I'm wondering whether just Politically speaking, these two should not be completely separated uh, in whatever we say, because we seem to be subsuming them, right? So that that's that's a comment. Three questions. Uh, the first one is, um, you mentioned uh, a number of you, but especially Martin, the the uh, the, the, li the liquidity and and uh, temporary nature as obviously being reflected in, in the pricing of, of the bonds, as well as the fact that, of course, that the ECB necessarily, if you don't have something like this uh, much, there's a more hazard on what the ECB would have to pick on. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, does this argument not resonate at all? Uh, I mean, there seems to be uh, the people who are uh, um, sort of objecting to going in that direction that this is a, the kind of argument that should resonate with them because it's exactly what what they should be worried about, right? So, the question is: Do you see it, it not resonating? Second question is: If you could, especially Martin, perhaps, if you could update us a little bit on where the discussion on own resources is, uh, is it going anywhere or is it completely lost? Because that's, of course, the counterpart. Uh, having to do with the, you know, the democratic legitimacy at the end of the day of moving in, in, in that direction. And uh, finally, an, another question, um, Isabel put out the two kinds of options, one, the climate temporary, two, the more permanent. Of course, there's the defense, right? So again, a, a question on where we are, which of the three seems to be getting more traction at the moment. I'm guessing the defense one, uh, reading sort of the last few days. So I have one question and one remark. On the liquidity, I thought that the graph was fascinating, but for a different reason, which is that initially it was fine. And then there was this gap. So the explanation, which is, well, it's not liquid, doesn't seem to work, at least simply. Something else is happening. Uh, and I wonder whether this is not linked to, well, how are we going to pay for that stuff, which may be coming an issue. I mean, at this stage, you know, we're issuing bonds and hoping that revenues will come from somewhere. I wonder whether the markets are not saying, well... Maybe they don't find the money. Uh, so I, I would like to know anyway. I mean, somebody must know why the spread has appeared, and maybe Isabel does. So so that was a question. The, uh, the guess is you've just put in place new uh, budget rules, which in my opinion, as we have discussed, are too tough in the sense of not allowing for the right level of defense spending and 
and green warming and so on. And I wonder whether this is not creating some pressure on the government to actually say, well, if we can't do it, let's do it in Brussels. So that basically it's creating more support for anything which doesn't appear uh, to violate the uh, national rules. So indirectly, the tough rules may be creating some some support for doing more at the Brussels level. I wonder whether this resonates with you. Maybe I start by attacking the last question on this. Um, it must be something else than the liquidity point, right? So I have here a chart, but I don't know if I can share it because I once gave another presentation some time ago, exactly on this question. Yeah, And indeed, if you look, initially you think there's nothing going on if you look at the spread between the EU bonds and the German bonds and that suddenly the spread starts appearing. But this is true for all the agency bonds. So this is also true for the SM bonds. It's, you know, So the spread between the EU bonds and the other agency bonds has not increased, right? So, um, so, and and the, the moment that it changed was basically the moment we started announcing the end of PEP, right? So we started getting out of the very easy monetary policy. And that's when these issues start showing up. The agency bonds don't have a liquidity problem to the same degree, or do they? So, I mean, if you said, okay, so there's more demand for liquidity or something like this, we should affect different assets differently. Why would agency bonds react in the same way as EU bonds? So I'm talking here about ESM, KFW, EIB bonds. So I'm talking, you know, so the EU bonds are put in that that group, right? Um, and so, I mean, there were the, the, the EU bonds, I think at some point traded with a little bit of a premium even compared to them. But I think the commission, and this is where the learning comes, right? Did a lot of efforts to, you know, they had a lot of, there were a lot of market factors. They had a lot of primary dealers that was consolidated. They were trading under different names, right? So you had uh, sure bonds and GU bonds and then for international investors, it's difficult to, to get through that maze. So now they're trading as, I think under one label as EU yeah. bonds. So that also helped. But, you know, the spread with the other agents, I mean, you know, they don't trade with the spread vis-a-vis -vis the agency bonds, but the spread vis-a-vis -vis the sovereigns remains, right? So so it is this liquidity issue, temporality, you know, like this kind of where do we put them in our bucket of, of bonds that we buy um, kind of factor that is playing a role, right? So, um, yeah, but I, I I looked at my presentation and Vitor was showing that chart because I was expecting that question potentially to to come up that it's not just, just liquidity. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, are, yeah. are you done? Um, on that specific question, I was done, but there uh, were other yeah, questions. Sorry. Shall I? Yeah. Or you want to? No. Um, okay, there was a question. Um, should we want to have a permanent central fiscal capacity just for stabilization? Well, I mean, I, I, as a central banker, I will say yes, right? So so we care about uh, public goods as well, of course, and we think it's everything that's good for the euro area and for the EU, of course, is also makes the job of monetary policy always easier. But not having a fiscal capacity at the central level makes the job of monetary policy with so many national fiscal authorities much more difficult, right? And um, we have fiscal rules in terms of um, making sure that there's not overspending, but we don't have rules on underspending, right? For instance, and so your aggregate fiscal stance may not always be uh, aligned with you know your monetary policy stance, and that comes in terms of the discussion of monetary fiscal interaction, right? So, so I would argue, I mean, that's why I think from the outset, the monetary union and, and and fiscal union was seen as part and parcel of the same package, right? And it's not like things don't work most of the time, right? It's just it's not the most efficient way of of making them work, and and just you know. Also, I wanted to react a bit to what Martin had said, because you said, well, you know, we have a temporary instrument, we can set up something temporary again, but the problem is we only activate it in bad times, but, you know, you would want these instruments particularly to work in bad times. And setting them up more than once as a temporary instrument does show that if you have these shocks, you are willing to set them up again, because there is a narrative like once and never again. And that's that's also not a good signal to send um, you know, like where where do you put the threshold of of having such an instrument? You know, and th that's not understood for the moment. And I think that's an important question um, going forward. Um, just looking at other questions. Um, 
I mean, on, 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 on the public goods question, I mean, this is, of course, I, I will leave it more to Martin, but I mean, I, I guess that the narrative goes much more towards defense and to climate. When we started working on this question, it was more the climate uh, discussion was very prominent. And, and I think the debate has shifted, although some of these elements, for instance, like strategic autonomy, you know, are also, you know, in the climate discussion present. So I think generally the kind of public goods that ensure that you have strategic autonomy, I think is is a narrative that is is very important, right? So I think this is this is something that that stays. Um, you see, I, um, uh, one more thing I want to also react actually to to Martin because you said um, the ESM the bar has been put too high to request the ESM, but I think there's just a stigma overall for the ESM for the moment, right? So in the pandemic. There was actually an instrument set up for countries to go to the SM, and the bar was very low, right? They just had to fill out a spreadsheet. I mean, it was as low as it could get, and still nobody was requesting access to the SM. So I think there's a general question of stigma in going to the SM, and I and don't necessarily have an answer to hold the something. Yeah, yeah, you, you need something. You need so you need something new there, right? But uh, but there's definitely something more than just um, you know the bar is being too high to 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 go to the SM. And then finally, I think you know you said it's all about power, why right? You know there's no willingness for central fiscal capacity. I think it's also a matter of trust. Yeah, there there's still and I think Agnes said that actually it <laughs> got inspired by Agnes, but she said in the coffee break there's a lack of trust in the. Uh, in the you know between member states and you know, I didn't want to I didn't want to take your argument and take it as mine basically but uh, I, I think that that's a, that's a, a second argument that that makes it much more difficult to set up a central fiscal capacity but I think you can set up one that actually you know a central fiscal capacity may in some cases actually be better than having national fiscal rules right so on investment you know, you would have much more checks and balances with the central fiscal capacity than having them at the national level. So sometimes I don't understand the opposition to having it at the central level if your fear is really this kind of lack of trust. Because with the RRF, you know, there is a discussion, there is a group discussion in the committees on, on, on these instruments. But yeah, maybe then it's more about the power argument again. Uh, yes, I mean, all, uh, Olivier's point uh, why things have changed over time. Um, okay, I think what Eric said, I mean, in terms of market perception, it has become clear that uh, what was hailed as the Hamiltonian moment uh, uh, at the time, uh, uh, you know, paradigm shift, it became a very large, huge, but, you know, largely one of So... I don't know to what extent, I mean, the market incorporated this element uh, uh, here um, increasingly, so leading to a deterioration of the um, of market conditions. Also because, uh, I mean, and Isabel, I think, mentioned it uh, now, um, a number of problems related to, you know, technical issues uh, which hampered uh, liquidity, where we actually started to, you know, address them. So... So in a sense, it was uh, so the gap uh, is even uh, underlying gap is even larger in a, in a sense. No, I you had just one question in, um, to to Victor maybe uh, is that um, I mean you mentioned in the previous comments um, insurance based uh, so that was a session on uh, yeah. on national. And I wonder whether we should not think about uh, an insurance-based uh, tools, you know, at the um, at the European level, and not only at the national. Just make a very quick uh, remark. Uh, from my own point of view as a journalist, what I notice is that when you have okay, NGO, some money to spend, what governments want, they want to make the programs and distribute the money themselves because they leave it as the experience it as current spending and votes essentially uh except there is no trust like someone said and and then you have this uh trade off that doesn't work very well between efficiency and 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 checks and controls uh, so it's a difficult circle to square but again we are back uh, talking about institutions rather than economic models. Um, but anyway, uh, 
maybe. Okay, so quite a number of uh, exceptionally useful uh, points. Something that I didn't have time to elaborate, but I think it's important when we think about uh, strategic or autonomy or power, is that in a world where Europe is becoming smaller, we're in a sense back to the uh, very well-known phrase from Jean Monnet, pushing for European integration in 1954, so 70 years ago. He was basically saying that uh, our countries, he's talking about European countries, our countries have become too small for the world of today, for the US and Russia of today, for China and India of tomorrow. Now, Europe was significantly bigger in the world in 1954 than what is now. So the case for uh, European Union on world power type uh, considerations is much stronger now. Europe needs to be united to have a place at the table. This is a power type argument that probably will re resonate uh, politically. Uh, Marcelo, you did make two points. Uh, and your first point about the central fiscal capacity being evaluated by a multiplicity of criteria, not only stabilization, is something that I believe we would agree with around this table. It's not you and I agreeing. I think that everybody agrees that probably uh, European-wide collective goods are fundamentally more important than stabilization. And, and, and so that's absolutely fine. On your second point, I disagree with you. Your second point was you were saying that the fact that some activities are financed at European level but are actually produced at national level is a problem because you're not really centralizing. As a matter of fact, I would argue you are. You're centralizing the provision of public goods and you're using national governments as agencies, right? And so the agencies produce the public goods, right? But in the context where you are coordinating at European level, looks beautiful. But it creates an agency problem. What you were talking about, information, moral hazard, incentives. And that's why I was so fanatical about the need to evaluate the experience. It's not a trivial matter. And it's something that is much easier to do ex post than during the process. So this this is a big thing. I'm not going to be able to cover... May, may I react for, for one second on that? Uh, I agree with you. It's not a disagreement. Uh, it's exactly a problem of contract, uh, but it's uh, easier to incentivize a contract in which uh, the national level plays just the role of users uh, than a contract in which uh, national level plays uh, both the role of producer and user. So that's the, the real point to discuss, I guess. <clears throat> Right. So it's, it's an issue of mechanism design. It's not a trivial issue of mechanism design. I completely agree with that. Uh, a number of uh, points that I absolutely love were made. Let me just focus on one. I go basically each year to Brussels to uh, participate in the EU tax symposium. And the European Commission is kind enough to ask me to speculate about the structure of the revenue side of the EU budget by 2050. And what I basically say is that if we want the EU budget in 2050 to have the type of central fiscal capacity that we are discussing today, with a significant ability to provide EU-wide collective goods and do a number of other good things, one needs to have a situation where the um, European budget is able 
to um, adjust instruments that allow the service of the debt to be honored. That is, you absolutely need to have a revenue base uh, for that. You spoke, Marco, about the Hamilton moment. The first thing that Hamilton did was to build a federal administration that was able to collect taxes. So he knew that in order to uh, put the administration on a sound basis, he needed tax revenue, which, by the way, is the reason why I solve your stock flow problem, by focusing on the ratio between interest payments and tax. And I don't go for total revenues because the tax is the elastic part. And I was arguing in Brussels that one needs to have that flexibility at the European level if one wants to have a budget with this type of characteristics. What kind of tax could one think about? One could, for example, look at corporate income taxation for European companies, right? That is something that has a lot to do with the functioning of the single market. It does make sense uh, to think about a uh, European tax for very large uh, companies, and that could, uh, in a sense, be a candidate to be considered uh, in this context. It's not a minor thing at all, because, as I don't know who said it, there is nothing more political than taxation. I, I would love to comment on other stuff, but I don't think that you will allow me. A very small extra question for you. By uh, when do you think the EU must come up with a solution not to go uh, to the Blanchard problem of having real spreads? So I do think that this issue, Olivier, of uh, backing the, um, the uh, European bonds with uh, real European resources is a big deal. Uh, it, it is very much a political issue. Uh, problem, but please remember that the credibility of U.S. federal debt, when U.S. federal debt was supposed to be uh, financed by states' contributions, was dismal, because the discussion of uh, burden sharing across member states in uh, budget discussions is typically ugly, and Europe is not an exception. So if you have that kind of bickering underlying the uh, value of an asset, you're not, in a sense, giving that asset the best chance uh, to uh, fly in markets. And this thing uh, needs to be thought through uh, quite systematically. And people thinking about budget and financing must think about how markets will perceive it and react, and they should advance when they're sure uh, that they will get uh, their uh, reception uh, assured. In the case of Hamilton, not only did they uh, get the taxation part up and running, he got the support role from the Dutch, and so he knew that he had an international banker that was willing to back him up. And he made sure that US treasuries were uh, taken as the safe asset in crisis. He had to manage financial crisis very early on. And people who held US treasuries uh, got liquidity that was precious in the management of those crises. And, uh, you know that the man thought about this through systematically because he wrote about it, right? So perhaps we are going to have uh, another opera, Hamilton II, that will actually be singing all of this. Okay. Um, few quick quick uh, comments. Uh, so, so first on, on the question of... Um, let's say, well, central, centralized, you call the production centralized versus decentralized the production. Uh, first, the first thing to, to say is that the, uh, 
the the um, the RF is uh, was well, a bit technical, but it's it's a direct management instrument. In in other words, what what that means is that that every disbursement needs to be uh, and uh, so the assessment of whether milestones and taxes have been made are with with the Commission. So so that's in that sense, it is a central a central ele uh, element that our central central uh, system. That said. I mean, clearly, if you go into the reform space, but also in national infrastructure, it's very you 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 can only do this together with with uh, with with the government or even local governments. There's no, you cannot decree that completely from 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 the center. So so there is this. Uh, that's the first point. Second, the second point is that for, I think. I I, I believe now that it works well. We'll evaluate, but but uh, still, I, 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 I'm not saying it's perfect, but but I think it's 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 working. Um, but in the current form, it is less suitable for, and I think this is what what Ru mentioned. So cross really cross border uh, investment is you know uh, is is more difficult. <laughs> uh because it's always more complicated to 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 do projects that that go over uh, over over borders if if you have limited resources if you have limited time uh, to spend it then there is a tendency to to prioritize the non cross border uh, projects so i'm i'm saying this very honestly so so we're not satisfied with with how the RF uh, or the level of cross border uh, investment that the RF has 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 triggered, so so this is clearly something to 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 look into. Now maybe something can be done within the design of the instrument to 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 encourage that more, or one one needs to look at at other at other options. That that is, uh, I, but I do agree. If you you think about EU added value, that this is where the EU added value. Uh, obviously, truly, truly is not only, but but here this is a clear example. Um, now, to Eric's point here, I so so for me the argument again is is not stabiliz. I, I I think stabilization is important, but as I've said before, the common uh, for for me uh, better to emphasize the common goods nature. Uh, now, in that in in that same logic, what these Common goods or the common challenge they, they are common to the EU. They are not specific to to uh, to to the EU area. If you if you think about climate, if you think about uh, uh, defense, security, etc. So so these are EU wide common goods. Um, but clearly, if you were to finance them with common issuance, I think that benefits also the uh, the EU area. So so I, I would not make too big a thing about this distinction between the euro area and uh, and the and the EU uh, on uh, on this. Then there were uh, yeah some some questions about my assessment on where things are or where things are going. That that gets me in a more difficult uh, position. Now on 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 the own resources, let me just say this is a diff this has always been a difficult dis discussion and it's still. Is it a difficult dis discussion? I will not say that it will not lead to anything, but but it is it is difficult. Uh, will uh, the argument that that without a, a central fiscal capacity, uh, too much burden will fall on the ECB? Will that have traction? <laughs> I cannot. I cannot. Uh, I cannot say. I, but but I think it's generally good to realize that that um, things may have traction with with policymakers uh, or may may understand the point at the level of policy. But they are confronted with with constituencies and and th these type of arguments, uh, whether they have traction with the broad audience, I I, I doubt. I mean, they can be very true, but but. Uh, the, uh, so, so I would not not uh, trust too much on uh, on that. Similarly, on on Olivier's uh, here, I need to be very whether tough rules on the. I, I'm not so sure that we. I think we found a good balance in 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 in, in the rules, but whether tough rules would lead to to uh, to more openness for for central uh, doing things centrally. I, I, I think I should be very careful to to speculate on this uh, here and this this forum, knowing that 
it's not just this forum, but uh, people online also watching. Yeah, I think. <laughs> 17. <laughs> 17. Oh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> I think we have been fairly disciplined uh, with timing. Um, uh, uh, it happens to me to talk to people who live uh, within institutions and I hear them talking about economics. And tonight I was with economists talking about institutions. And I can tell you that the economists talk about institutions more competently than people who are in institutions talk about the economy. <laughs> so. <laughs> And uh, with that, I think we can move to dinner. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Competent chair, because we have our conclusion. Sorry. I, it's very late, so just let me <clears throat> thank you, all the participants. I just want to make two quick points. On oh no, I'm also the, the, the caretaker of the research side of the EMU lab. And, uh, you know, there are, the Lab is a multidisciplinary, it will be more and more multidisciplinary. I see Vertraud and other people here. We have this idea that we bring more people to think about this thing, hopefully very soon. We have been thinking for a long time with uh, ADEMU, a previous program here with models of uh, intertemporal insurance. I just want to make a couple of points. First, uh, somebody mentioned the insurance aspect of fiscal policy, which are more and more important. There is actually been, there is hope that uh, not only heterogeneous age, but also heterogeneous firms, banks, there is a lot of work doing micro to macro assessment design of fiscal policy because of the points you made that is not only the macro aspect, but also the incentive aspect of stabilization that is important. So we are trying to build up large data set, data reach, billions of data, millions of data in which you can actually see what happened, simulating what happened when you change VAT in certain ways. This is a frontier that I hope will come soon. The second thing I want to just flash a missing point, which I think is a problem now, the language. We are still talking about temporary and permanent shock, supply and demand. I think we need to go a little bit ahead of that. Shocks are increasingly sectoral, finance, uh, uh, credible goods, manufacturing, sectoral shocks means that we have, uh, we are a little bit at a loss, we measure our slack. Output gap in one sector is over, no, like, there are different, you, you take the average of different sectors is zero, and, and there is lack in the economy. There is an issue of how, what inflation means with relative price, what VAT means with relative price. So we also know that sometimes you give money and money goes into prices and imports. There is also this issue, so more sectoral study of the multiplier there uh, are coming. Um, the transmission no? through which shocks go through, through that. And this brings me to the, to the second language, which is, this language has actually already been there, tail risk, disaster, disaster shock. And then it's actually something that to me is not only climate change, but there's also a lot to do with the uh, growth and complexity of the financial sector. With a financial sector like this, even innocuous, temporary, uh, small, fundamental shock may become enormous macroeconomic shock because of instability that comes out, out of our, our inability to, to stabilize. And the problem of Europe is a little bit that. The problem is that macroeconomic stabilization, financial stabilization, sometimes in the past, lack the capacity to contain, to contain the size of the shock. So I think that uh, this is a little bit the frontier how do we think of this thing? And in, in my view, we, we, Mark, we have been discussing this, is really a problem of how do, to keep and create policy space. That, that does not mean fiscal policy space. It really means you know, the ability to use instruments to contain the, the, the effects of shocks. I think this is a little bit the challenge also for that. Uh, Olivier Branchard put this very nicely, this idea of uh, uh, automatic stabilizer that may come in stabilize, avoid this endogenous propagation, pro provided that they're, they're then coming back, they come back, they retreat. Having said so, sorry for this long, long uh, final consideration. I could, not, I could not be silent after this. But uh, thank you again. And I think, you know, I, I, again, I would invite everybody to make a round of applause again to, to our speakers. Thank you.